This is Greg Pruitt, formerly of the Cleveland Browns, and you're listening to The Sports Fix. Sports Fix listeners, like us on Facebook today. Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix. Business owners and professionals, do you want to take your business, your product, your team, your event to the next level? You want to advertise right here with the Sports Fix. Our listeners are among the most loyal listeners, terrestrial or internet. The Sports Fix universe is not only the radio show, but tens of thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter. Email me, Jerry Myers, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. That's the Sports Fix at AOL.com. And let me help you swing for the fences and hit it out of the park right here on the Sports Fix. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Fantasy Jocks. Visit FantasyJocks.com, your fantasy sports superstore. Championship belts, rings, trophies, and more. Live in Ohio, it's time to get your fix. The Sports Fix. Look at me, guys. Look at me. I'm ashamed of myself here, man. So behind here. Take a couple of days off, and and look what happens. We're just falling off here. I'm I'm making the Facebook invite for the show at 11:59 and sending it out there as we're supposed to be going on the air. I'm trying to send out all the last minute things that go with getting on the air at 12 o'clock as we're getting on the air. Ah, there we go. It doesn't matter. We're here. We're off and running. It's Friday. It's a new week. Or not just, or a new month, excuse me. Not just a new week. It's a new month next week, baby. It's a new season. Baseball's cracking, man. There's so much going on, man. I had to come back in today. I was joking with some of the guys in uh, on Facebook the other day. I said I should have took Friday off and just made it a, a nice long run through, but I couldn't, man. I had to get back here. A couple days for me was too much to be away from this thing. So here we go. We've got a lot going on today. It's a Friday end of the week edition of the Sports Fix here. We've got so much to get into. We've got the Final Four going on this weekend. National Championship game looming. We've got baseball. There's what? Two. One, two. (laughs) That's it. Spring training games. We're at opening day, baby. Cavaliers. Playoff time is coming. We've got so much to do. Eddie Jansen from More Than a Fan, or excuse me, Eddie Jansen from the Chronicle. He'll also be here. Uh, Both of the Eddie Jansons here. They're one in the same They'll be here today talking some Cavaliers hoops. Cannot wait. Matter of fact, Eddie will be with us uh, relatively early on in the show. We've got some time to open up the phones, by the way. I'm going to do that in a minute. Jeff Gorman's going to be here talking a little Indians and Browns. We're going to go outside the mix here. A little season preview here for the Tribe is when we come back on Monday. Man, that's it. Dan Wismar's going to be here with us. We're going to be getting ready for the first game of the baseball season. So today, we've got a lot to get into with that. Tons of stuff to do. We'll talk about all the stuff that's been going on man you guys ready to rock and roll and launch this edition of the sports fix because i am so let's get ready and let's do it welcome in you guys to the sports fix i'm your host haven't been here for a few days maybe you're here for the first time maybe you're back some of you were like hey where'd you go i was out for a minute but i'm back my name is the big daddy on the microphone that's what some of you call me jerry myers j rock whatever you want to call me i am the guy that helps coordinate the madness here each and every weekday at noon live across the sports fix radio network maybe you're enjoying us here on tune in tune in's radio app world worldwide maybe on spreaker and mixler and their respective digital and mobile applications perhaps you're enjoying us and streaming the show directly on our home base the sportsfix.net however you're doing by the way make sure you bookmark that there you guys because no matter what it's always a perfect place to Get a backup feed to the show. Any of the sites you listen to don't work. If you need to get a hold of us, if you want to interact with us on social media, thesportsfix.net is a one-stop shop for all things you need right there. I mean, literally, the widgets are right there. You can interact with us on social media while you're on the site listening to the show. Can't beat it. Make sure you bookmark it. Thesportsfix.net as well. All of you guys, welcome in listening. Thousands around the world. 
on digital delay, 24 hours a day, all different places and time zones and zip codes and all of that on iHeartRadio, the world's largest internet radio provider, on iTunes, on Stitcher Radio, SoundCloud, CarPlay, all of the places. I Potter, I'll tell you what, I found a new, uh, a matter of fact, they found us, I should say. Uh, I get an email over, I was, I was out for the last couple of days, and it's uh, from this this uh, service, this iPotter.org, I don't know, whatever it is, uh, I can tell you that uh, Clearly, they get some traffic because I get a thing that says, hey, uh, we've selected your show to feature, et cetera, so forth. And uh, I'm like, OK, cool, whatever. I didn't have to do anything on my end. That happens a lot with with uh, with some of this. You know, people, hey, it, you know, it's, it's as simple as uh, as as that. They, they go, hey, we're featuring you on our thing. I go, oh. Okay, well, thank you very much. Anyways, so there you go. And I go check the numbers on the feed that they're using. And sure enough, boom, 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 there you go. I said, okay, well, I don't know what you are, but clearly people do. So there's another place. So if you're an iPotter.org person, I don't know. Welcome in. I have no clue what that is, but it's another place that people get the show. I love it, you guys. Thank you so much. And as I say all the time, you guys, you don't just get your fix. You are the sports fix, you guys. And you are the voice of the show. So use it because I'm going to crack open those phone lines. 216-539-7535. 216-539-7535. They're not only open live, by the way. They're open 24-7. If something's going on at 3 a.m., late night tribe live, they go into 17 innings and you want to talk about it afterwards, bam, drop your take on the hotline. 216-539-7535. Right now, they're open live. We've got Eddie Jansen joining us, but that's going to be just about 10, 15 minutes from now. So I've got time to get at least one or two of you guys in on the phone lines. 216-539-7535. Facebook, Twitter. Can't get to the phone? Maybe you're streaming us live on your phone. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix. C-L-E. Email us. The sports fix at AOL.com. Make sure you like and follow us, by the way, on our social media. Join nearly 25,000 plus, I believe the number is. Something like that. Uh, uh, combined between our social media. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Phone's already ringing. Tweet with us at the sports fix. C L E. Email us the sports fix at AOL.com. I'll tell you what, guys, man, you hit Easter weekend here as we get rolling. I'm going to, I'm going to jump right into these phones in a moment before I even get to a, anything deep on the show here, but you get to this weekend here and you know, of course you get the masters Lumen. you've got, you know, this means we've got national championship weekend here. Final four end of April hitting May or, uh, or end of May or excuse, end of good Lord. End of March hitting April. I'm already a month ahead of myself. I'm flying ahead. You know what I mean? End of spring training opening day. These all come right around at the same time and you get that, you know, hopefully sustained break in the weather finally. And it's just, uh, it's a fresh feeling. It's a great feeling, man. This is a, a great, and of course, playoff time coming in the NBA. I know that hasn't been as meaningful here in Cleveland for the last uh, four seasons or so, but uh, it's this annual thing that they do where the top eight teams in each conference get together and then they have this little tournament battle for the championship. I know it's kind of a, if you haven't watched basketball in less than five years here in Cleveland, it would be a novel concept to you, but we're going to participate in these playoff activities here this year so that should be a fun time too it's just gonna be it's it's just a great time of year and it makes you feel good get the you know you get the closet fever over with you get out there speaking of closet fever speaking of getting out there and i'm not gonna i won't get too detailed into this right now because it is it's an ongoing you know kind of negotiation thing but uh i want to pitch this out here and i'm just curious you guys hit me up over the next couple of days as i know a lot of you guys uh filter in over the weekend and listen to it at various times so just give me your thoughts but uh working on expansion here coming up in the uh, summertime of the sports fix and i think it, an opportunity has presented itself that could be pretty cool and allow us to continue to do what we're doing here uh with this version of the show uh but expand at the time or at the same time back onto the terrestrial radio dial in a way that just continues to uh enhance what we're doing and really put it all together and uh what we're looking at is a midweek looking at wednesday evenings here a midweek version a three-hour version of the sports fix on <laughs> i'll tell you what actually on a combination of radio dials it, it actually is a really unique thing again i'm not gonna go too much into it but basically the only the only thing that would change is i i do believe that in order to do it the best i would probably 
change the, say it's Wednesday is the day that we decide on. I would probably make that the version of the show. So on, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, noon, right here across whatever your platform is that you're listening to the Sports Fix. On Wednesdays, I think that would be the show, would be the Wednesday evening three-hour show. But the cool thing about it is whether you listen on that station, on any of their feeds, any of their internet ways to listen to the show, I'll also be able to feed the show exactly the same way that you guys listen to it now. So in all reality, the only thing that would change for you guys, the current audience, all of you guys, thousands of you, is the time that you listen on Wednesdays. And so many of you listen on your own time anyway. Uh, the live audience is just a fraction of what the total audience is uh, because it's the one of the cool things about the the way this is presented is you can do it at your leisure, at your schedule, and all of that stuff. You're not uh, bound and constricted by times and all of that. So it would be kind of cool. It would switch that up, but it would also it would be a constant on-air presence to continue to funnel people in. I mean, hey, I think we have a lot of fun here doing what we do. So the more they come across it there, the more they would go, hey, these cats are on the air four other days of the week. I just see a lot of great things. An awesome opportunity to expand things uh, for all of for all of what we're doing here and uh i love it so it's something that we're working on and i want to know what you guys think because it isn't just uh, isn't just about me i'm curious but it's something that we're working on here and i'm i'm sh- i'm serious enough about it that i brought it up here on the air to let you guys know that that's definitely something in the and, and really it would it would be relatively soon i would say within the next few months here you know hopefully in time to catch the back end of a playoff run for the cavaliers here you know and take advantage of that but it could be some some really good stuff here. It could lead to a lot of synergy along the way and just really, uh, if anything, put a, put a rocket ship on what we're able to do um, growing the show here just the way I do it, grassroots as it is. That would add something to it. But really, for those of you guys that listen here, it would it would really change very minuscule what you would do with the exception of your one day a week the timing of when you would listen would change but uh i think it's something that could be well worth it and i'd like to hear you guys weigh in on that too and of course uh as things get more then i'll let you know more if it becomes there who knows i mean it could it could fall away into the ether but i'm pretty sure as i said enough to bring it up on the show that this could be a relatively uh, a relatively happening thing guys relatively happening captain so we'll see what's up with that talk to you more let me know what you guys think as well but uh, uh, something that uh, has me pretty intrigued here as we continue to move on. Speaking of, I'm intrigued by who's on the phone lines. I'm not even going to start any content. Eddie Jansen is coming up five minutes from now. We're going to talk some calves. They took care of business. Business, baby, against the Miami Heat. By the way, somebody, I, I was tweeting and, and, and Facebooking this out yesterday. Somebody find Brian Windhorst stat because clearly there's a giant conspiracy going on. That's why Kyrie Irving was pretending to be sick yesterday and Kevin Love was pretending to be hurt. They're, they're, they're protesting David Blatt. Has to be what's going on, right? I don't know, man. What's I, I get a trip out of uh, while I was gone and I guess it's a good thing because we would have just been railing all of us about this and you would have heard me going on and on about this for the last couple of days. That ridiculous, you know, who's calling the play? Well, you know, uh, David Blatt's really just a puppet. He just stands there and repeats what LeBron said. And, like, and, and then you hear all around everybody. I mean, not just the Cavs, around the NBA everybody's like this is this is a non-story story this is the way it goes what you, what is this guy talking about this is what is this trying to make something out of nothing that drives me absolutely nuts and it's a function of of I don't want to say what we do because I don't I don't subscribe to that theory here with what we do but we're all lumped in together here in in a cat and that's a bad thing but uh, unfortunately we all get lumped into the same category there but that's terrible that's terrible garbage that's clickbait except it's audio clickbait that's all it is man and uh brian winhorse couldn't get on with bill simmons and bill simmons the guy who s- sat there during the lottery drawing and and railed against how awful cleveland was and how he wished anybody other than cleveland would have won right 
Right. So these are a couple of real neutral parties here, you know. And uh, But anyways, the way they put this story out, and, and people all over are talking about it, and then everybody else is coming out and going, look, I don't know what this non-story is here about this, this call-in plays and all this nonsense. And what's so hilarious is, like, the same day that it breaks, it, David Black <laughs> gets the coach award. So on top of this, you know, you got that, and uh, and it was just too – it was ironically funny, too, because some of the news stories, like, that get auto-posted on Facebook and Twitter uh, – about that had LeBron's picture because it's it's a Cavs story and instead of David Blatt's you know just an action shot so you've got the naturally funny connection there of a headline that says David Blatt wins coach of the year and the picture is LeBron James playing basketball but anyways uh it was just it was ridiculous it is what it is of course of course the guy who carries the ball or handles the ball 90% of the time and, and Kyrie Irving's like man I uh, I called plays too man I'm just saying like that's what happens. That's how this goes. But uh, it doesn't sound as interesting to say, well, as happens around the NBA, the players sometimes call their own shots. It's a call the players league for a reason. Yeah, the players sometimes call their best, call their own shots, especially the better players. But uh, guess what? And I'll throw this up all the time because I'm the guy that goes, well, LeBron, Michael Jordan did this. Michael, guess what? Michael Jordan called his own plays too. He didn't call them all. Nobody calls them all. But that I don't even know why I'm talking about this because it's such a stupid non-story story but you know they had to have something to something to go out there and talk about and uh yeah, whatever man windhorse just blowing things out of proportion as usual uh expect to see a ton more of that we're hitting playoff time expect a controversy after every single cavaliers game shouting will be heard behind closed doors at one point somebody will think that they've seen Kyrie irving's foot sticking out the door and lebron james slamming the door into his ankle because yeah I don't know, man. Whatever they, whatever they can sell you, if you're buying it, they'll. If you're even buying a a tiny bit of it, then they'll sell you a whole scoop and shovel full more of it. But I'm out, and I, I'm not on the air, and I'm seeing this story, and I'm like, you know what? Fortuitous timing. Maybe I just picked a fortunate couple of days because it's ridiculous. But come on, man. Windhorse is out there uh, with that ridiculousness again, and it turns out that. It's a non-story being blown up into a story once again. There's enough stories going on that you don't need non-story stories. But anyway, so uh, I don't know. I, I told Eddie Jansen before he joins us today, I said, man, if LeBron's calling your plays, I can't have you on the show. Man, he said, brother, nobody calls my plays for me. I said, that's what I want to hear. So I'm not going to call your play for you. I'm going to let you call the play. Coach, caller on the phone line. You're up first on the sports fix. What's up, coach? Seriously, hey. man, they got, they got, they, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, caller. I just one more line. They got people like like they go in the huddle and and David Blatt walks in the huddle and goes, What's up, Ron? And Bron goes, Well, we're gonna run 32, 15, 12 blue. What do you say, coach? I say run 32, 15, 12 blue. Do what the man says. Come on, man. I mean, really, man. Like, like, anyways, but uh whatever. Caller, you're up on the fix. What's happening? Good morning, J Rock. Good morning. And hey, in my that's opinion, my man Bruce. I don't care who's making the call as long as they win. So it doesn't well, really I mean, matter. But still, come on. As you heard, <laughs> you, you saw that story evolve over 72 hours from uh, David Blatt's just a puppet and LeBron's literally standing in the huddle and telling telling David Blatt what plays to call. And David Blatt's just going, yeah, like LeBron said, we're going to run this, that, and this. And then over the next 24 to 48 hours, everybody around the league and everybody's like, oh, um, there's no story there. I mean, that's just that's what happens when they're on the field, you know, when they're on the court, they're seeing things. Sometimes they call some plays. And when you're in timeouts, then sometimes the coach calls the play. Sometimes the players say, here's what it's a player's league. It, the NBA, it, and I don't mean this to discredit uh, coaching because it still exists. They're, hey, look, Popovich, some of these guys have the respect of their players and they truly are able to coach but that's a rare breed in today's NBA in today's NBA it's a it's a player's league and I think that's a bad thing to be honest with you but regardless what a non-story story and of course it's you know Cleveland's good buddy Brian Windhorst who by the way when Cleveland and Cleveland media outlets wrote his paycheck he was a completely different Brian Windhorst than when all of a sudden his paycheck was being written by people who have an agenda uh, that has different agendas. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, you know, I mean... It's I garbage, Bruce. Much, uh, Come on, man. Much faith in Winhurst anyway, so... 
Did you see it? I mean, obviously, I was out of oh, town, yeah, but I saw Everybody's it. Everybody's seen it. It was a big uh, thing on TNT last night. Oh, yeah. You know, like, I was out of town for two days, and it was all, it was on the headlines, and I'm like, what in the world? And and anyways, yeah, he goes on Simmons' podcast or whatever and says, oh, yeah, man, you know, LeBron calls the plays, and David Black just repeats what he says, man. That's all it is. Yeah, it's and like, LeBron said, I, you know, I call some of the plays. Of you know, course. Like, you know, everybody, <laughs> you know. Aaron oh, Rodgers calls man. plays. I mean, come I'm on. just saying, man. Come on. I mean, look, it's just it's a non-story story. But then again, you have to have they feel they have to have something to talk about every day, man. And then you wonder, well, and that's that's what makes me mad because people brush us all in the same brush, and they think that everybody with a microphone does the same thing. And I hate that because that is not. You got to remember, though, it's Cleveland media, and if there's no story, they make one up. So, well, that's you the know. thing that I can't stand. I believe there's a responsibility. There's a difference when you're talking about your opinions. Now, I don't mean that people can't have opinions. I like people, don't like people. That's fine, as long as you make it very clear the difference between opinions and facts and news. Because I think that's the thing as long as you make that clear then there's no big deal i can i can have my opinion so can you all day long if if my opinion is that johnny manzel's a, a horrible quarterback okay that's my opinion whether it's true or not if i try to attach some made up story to give basis to my opinion that's wrong and that's what these guys do you know that now maybe i come out and say hey I, I'll just tell you that I talked to 54 players and 52 of them said that he's horrible. Okay, now I'm just making things up, but I didn't have to attach any sources to it. I didn't have to attach any credibility to it. And then, boom, somebody takes that story and runs with it. Word out of Cleveland. 52 members of the Browns think Johnny Manziel's the worst quarterback in history. And that but is But you can the- do that the other way, too. You know, you can actually have stats to back that up, you know, back up your statement. And that, you know, but that's that kind of clarifies still. What I'm, everybody's talking about. But what I'm saying is the difference is 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 it one is an opinion and then one is making up a, a, a story and making up these these sources and these unclear and that's the only reason that I can't stand when I when I have when I have to do it too. When I say, hey man, look, I, I this is what I was told. And people, ah, well, you okay? Well, you you're free to think that or not, but I wouldn't bother telling you this, you know, if somebody didn't tell me that, you know. Doesn't mean it always happens, but but again, so many people run to the radio, run to the TV, and they go blah 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 blah, and they have no personal responsibility about it. Very true. Very true. But, and the plain whatever. dealer is probably the most uh, <laughs> responsible. For there that. you go. But I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. There's things I don't like about the plane dealer. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I definitely have a different opinion about them than I did. Although I do think they've got some, I know you're not, uh, you know, a fan of much of what they do. You know, I do like Terry Pluto. I thought I was going to bring it up later. I thought, you know, once again, his uh, yearly preseason sit down with Paul Dolan. I I thought it was pretty good, man. I really liked uh, reading it again. So many people are so turned off on the Dolans that it doesn't matter what they say. They'll just fast forward through it all and go, blah, blah, cheap, cheap, no money, blah, blah, blah. So that's not what I got out of it. But, you know, so, but I'm with you. I mean, I don't, and again, that's brushing everybody in the same brush. I don't like to do that because there are guys that I think do such a good job at what they do, even if I may not appreciate the outlet that they work for. Uh, now, see, I was thinking more on terms of the um, article yesterday about uh, bringing up the losing the Chief Wahoo again. You know, they well, bring up the same article continue. every year. Well, I know. That's always going to be. That's what I say, the, the lowest common denominator radio. You can always know that three, four days before the home opener, a week before the home opener, you're going to start getting those stories. And matter of fact, that was something that uh, they addressed in that uh in that article, which I really liked it because uh, I like I like the Indians' approach. I don't think it's as brazen as the what the Redskins are doing. I don't think it's just a complete thumb, you know, thumb the nose at everybody who who does. I, we do know that there's a small percentage of people who don't appreciate Chief Wahoo. Not anywhere near the furor that there is around the Washington Redskins, but there still is. Oh, without a fact, doubt. In that interview, I liked how I liked how Paul Dolan talked about that. He said, we are sensitive to that, and we definitely understand that there is a portion of the fan base that, that does 
have certain feelings, but we recognize that it's the most beloved symbol of this franchise, and we want to balance that. It's not all over the place. We don't emphasize it. We don't force it on people, but it is part of the heritage, and we have no plans for a change. I just think in such a corporate world, it's so many people roll over so quickly. I do appreciate that they didn't hedge their bets and say, well, you know, we always consider, he said, look, we think we're being respectful the way we're doing it, and we don't plan on a change. And uh, and you know what? Hey, for all of what they say, that's true. They pushed the Block C like crazy. And uh, in that article, they pointed out what did the most sales. The Chief Wahoo cap was still the number two baseball cap for all Indians uh, merchandise that they sold. And that's with the team not promoting it, not pushing it, not anything. So that'll show you that to much of the fan base, it's still means something and I don't and I I'll make the argument to everybody not one person in that fan base wears that thing with the tiniest bit of disrespect meant towards anybody and what people don't really um I don't know, remember or even know you know depending on when you were born was that until Dick Jacobs bought the team we never had a wahoo on the hat well we had it in 51 to 62 we had the C, the, the, C, the wishbone, yeah, wishbone yeah. C with the Wahoo in the middle. Yep. But that was the only time that we ever had a Wahoo on the hat. And by the way, and guys, so, Bruce would know because my man Bruce has the most awesome collection of one of every single hat, and legitimate time hats of every era of one that they've they've had. I think it's one of the coolest things, man. So he knows what every Indian's hat has been because he's got one of every one of them. And we've always had a C on the hat. I mean, it was, you know, black C, square C, the, you know, the, the wishbone in two different colors. You know, it, it, it just depends, but it's always been a C on the hat. You know, and I always go back to, again, I totally can make a different argument if we're talking about other versions of Chief Wahoo, because I do agree that previous versions of Chief Wahoo were incredibly offensive, you know, as many things were in the 60s and 70s and 80s and, and even 90s. Some of the political correct stuff, it just, just you can't do certain things. Matter of fact, having nothing to do with sports, oh, what was it I was watching? I was watching some... You fall down the rabbit hole on YouTube every once in a while, and you just go from one video to the other. And I found a series of videos through all different uh, commercials, uh, different things, of things that you could never get away with. I'm talking about just uh, terms that people used in commercials and very non-politically correct stuff that you could never put in a commercial today. And I started watching a whole series of these, and I'm like, wow, the things that were just okay to say and okay to do back in the day uh, that you could just never, you know, you know, because you offend so many people now and you go, wow, I can't believe I just heard that. And that was a commercial that went all over the place, you know, but uh, um, and I'd say that about Chihuahua. There are previous versions of it that you go, no, now that's uh, that's pretty offensive. But I stick to my story. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. This Chihuahua to me is strictly a baseball logo. It's a caricature man you know and i still think that the indians could soften a lot of that criticism if they just turned them into a red baseball put the same eyes put the same mouth put the same feather on his cap and just call him call him wahoo just don't call him the chief anymore and now he's a screaming red baseball and then nobody can say anything you know but, right uh, Anyway, you know, if you uh, purely want to talk offensive logos, you know, how about the Padres? I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> you know, why not by the way, the Pope on there, you while know? we're I mean, talking like, about uh, logos, just real quick, <laughs> I got to appreciate this. And I hate the Cincinnati Bengals. No, I don't hate them. I just dislike Cincinnati because of the football thing. Hate is way too strong for uh, for football. But uh, but did you see the April Fools that they did on their social media? They put out. Uh, a new Third. color scheme, 
and they just tweaked yeah, their the helmet oranges. Was one shade darker. Yeah, than it. yeah, they were ribbing the Browns over their color change. But what was funnier was the way they wrote it because they they kind of spoofed all the words that the Browns used about you know keeping the tradition and and all of that stuff and and changing the lettering and and in more impactful fonts and different colors. Anyways, I don't like the Bengals, but I thought that was a a cute little. You can't just change your font a little bit and make a big deal out of it and not expect people to have a little fun with that. But that's okay. I'd much rather have fun with that than actual bad stuff. You know. No, what I my mean? favorite one was the uh, Cleveland Orchestra. They put out the exact same logo but a darker shade of blue and they well, said yeah, they, you know, lots they were of, keep- Oh yeah, lots of places did that <laughs> in the days after the Browns thing. They just literally changed the shade just a tiny bit and said this is our new logo, you know. We spent millions to redevelop it and, and all of that stuff. But anyways, hey Bruce, what up? Man, here we go, man. We're up against it. You feeling good about the Indians here? Um, my pitching is still a little spective. Um, I like the bullpen. My starting rotation, um, I don't know. I, I was reading the um, Baseball Digest the other day, and they were talking about Kluber and um, how he struck out five in his last performance, and uh, he pitched like three in the third innings. But he gave up two runs, so he's given up almost a run an inning, and he's striking out, you know, five in, five in, uh, you know, in that amount of time. But... Uh, his his runs is almost one run an inning. You know, it's like, you know, this late in the spring, it kind of makes me a little nervous. Um, I like um, Carrasco, and and I I thought McAllister would have a bounce back year, and um, he he turned out to be the best pitcher in the spring so far. So with that, you know, going into the season. They have to get off to a uh, a quick start. They can't go, um, you know, six and fourteen in the first twenty and expect to keep up in the division. Um, you know, I'm looking at the White Sox with all their power. They're going to be the the competition. I don't see the Royals, uh, you know, being equal in what they did last year. Oh, I hear you on that, man, you know, and we're definitely going to talk a whole lot more here in a little bit when Jeff Gorman joins us. But, yeah, I'm with you on the Royals, too, man. Um, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm I'm feeling all right here about the Indians. We'll see. I want to see how they start the season, but uh, I'm I'm feeling good. I don't know. Maybe it's the optimism of the beginning of the season, but, uh, but we'll, well see. Well, we all man. have that now. Absolutely. You've know, you got to be optimistic. Absolutely. I mean, you know, in the spring, everybody starts off 0-0, zero, zero and, you know, and you always have that high hope. But uh, no, this year I honestly believe they're going to be into it, in it to the end. But uh, you know, I, I look at you know different teams being the competition and not Detroit. Um, and it was nice to see Verlander go on the DL for a change. You know, I thought he should have been on the DL last year. Yeah. But uh, you know, um, it's nice to see Detroit have trouble with their pitching. Um, it makes it a lot easier on us. Um, not that I wish bad things on people, but, you know, Detroit is Detroit. Um, the team that, um, you know, is probably the most improved in our division is the Twins, and they didn't improve enough to uh, even compete. So, you know, I mean, oh, other I than... Think, I think Chicago improved. Well, if you're just talking about improved, the, yeah, I think yeah. Chicago, yeah. Yeah, Chicago, without a doubt, got more power. I mean, that they already had power, and now they got more. I don't think everything um, they did was great. I'm with Mike Brandenberry. Like, I don't agree with every move they made. But getting better from last year to this year, I think Chicago probably improved the most of any team. I thought Minnesota did, too, because I don't think the Indians necessarily improved like a uh, total sum of their pieces i don't think any of the top three teams really did they canceled out some lot the indians really lost nothing you know what i mean they kind of stayed the same the best they're the most consistent as far as what's coming back over from last season to, to the other two teams had to fill holes and, and that obviously yeah they made some moves but it was to fill guys that went out so 
uh, as far as Kansas City and Detroit goes. Chicago and Minnesota, they made moves, but they were so far behind that they really had a long gap to clear. So that's kind of why... You know, I like where the Indians sit starting the season. But, Mike, you know, going back to what we were talking about the other day, and I can't look past this, is I do agree with his assessment that if it stays close most of the season, as always, Detroit has the advantage because they've got the money and the ownership to go out there and pull the trigger on a move that none of the other teams will dare go make. That you is know? true, except for the fact that, um, I, you know, I don't feel that Detroit um, replaced what they had lost. I agree. I agree. But they still, they, they're they still, they're, don't, I'm not writing the epitaph on <laughs> Detroit Tigers just yet. Because I think some people are writing them off too quick. But they strike me as a team that can get old fast. And a team that if they do start to catch the injury bug, if they start to catch some trouble, then they could be a really expensive 500 team. You know what I mean? Exactly. They have two pitchers that are down already. And, right. um, and B-Mart is starting to get pains in his knee again. So. Absolutely. No, I agree with you, oh. man. I agree. Bruce, I got to go. Anything else, my man? I'm um, good at the moment. Thank you All for your right. time, J-Rock. Sounds good, my man. Have a good one. That's my man, Bruce, guys. And uh, we're going to talk some more Indians here in just a little bit. So sit tight, Tribe fans. Jeff Gorman's going to join us top of the next hour. Right now, let's keep the good feelings going, though. Indians, they're hopefully marching to some playoffs. But, baby, that is a long baseball season away. Cavaliers are at the back end of a long basketball season, and they're getting primed and playoff pumped, baby. Let's get Eddie Jansen in on the conversation and talk some Cavaliers. Cavaliers hoops coming up next here. Don't go anywhere. Cavs put some work in against the Miami Heat last night. Let's talk about that and more when we come back with Eddie Jansen talking Cavs hoops next here on the Sports Fix. Get your fix. Cause it's Friday. You ain't got no job, and you ain't got to do. It's the Sports Fix. We'll be right back. Hey, guys, before we go to the break, I want to talk to you a little bit again about our good friends at Harry Buffalo North Olmsted, the UFC, the ultimate fighting championships, some of the hottest fights in the world today, each and every one of their huge events. Harry Buffalo is one of the few places in Northeast Ohio you can go there and watch each and every UFC fight at the Harry Buffalo. And let me tell you, I've been there. The people are out the door. They are to the rafters. It is one of the craziest environments for some UFC fights. Wing Mondays, they've got great deals on wings and drinks. And every day of the week, there's a different special, a different deal. And don't forget the Bison Burger, the unbelievable. It is the combination of a fantastic burger and eating healthy combined into one unbelievable sandwich you have got to get a bison burger while you're there so whatever you're looking for whatever day of the week monday through friday saturday sundays there's something for you at the harry buffalo north olmstead just outside great northern mall check them out today harry buffalo join the herd the sports fix is on iheart radio download the free iheart app today subscribe to the show and get your fix Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and And starts starts getting getting real. real. And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Nobody Nobody does does that that like like Fantasy Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. There's literally only one place to go. FantasyJocks.com Here we go, bring it on in. It's time now. It's all city. We got to do it for them, dog. We got to do it for Cleveland. They're waiting on us. Every single night, every single practice, every single game, we got to give it all we got because they're going to ride with us. Everything that we do on this floor because of this city, we owe them. We're going to grind for this city. They're going to support us, man, but we got to give it all back to them. We get it done. The toughness that we have on the court is going to come from this city. Everybody, the whole city of Cleveland, that's what it's all about. It's time to bring them something special. 
Let's go. Bring it on in, everybody. Let's go. Hard work on three. Together on six. One, two, three. Hard work. Four, five, six. Together. One, two, three. Hard work. Four, five, six. Everybody, this is Jerry the King Lawler from WWE, and you're listening to the Sports Fix. Hey, man, who's that cat coming down the street? I don't know, but it sounds to me like that different man with the bone. You're having himself a ball. <laughs> Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live across the Sports Fix Radio Network. J-Rock back with you here and getting ready to roll on. My man, Eddie Jansen's getting ready to join us here in just a few moments. You hear a little sweet Georgia Brown in the background. I think I just like any any excuse I can every once in a while to throw that out there. My man, Eddie Jansen from the Lake County Sentinel getting ready to join us here. Talk some Cavs hoops. We'll probably talk a little Indians baseball before we're done too as well. Eddie likes to get a little funky like that. He's going to join us momentarily. Cavaliers got funky last night. That's for sure. Uh, as they took on the Miami Heat and I don't know if people, you know, using terms and t- talking about making statements and and all of that kind of stuff, but uh, that is a team that the Cavaliers Made, but although they knocked him out of it last night with the uh, with the victory, but that is a team that the Cavaliers may potentially deal with in the first round of the playoffs, and so of course uh, you had that in the mix. Although definitely not the full thrust version of either team, uh, and what you would see in that situation, of course, Kevin Love uh, down with the back. He sat out there after saying just earlier in the day that he was good to go after a couple of days rest. Um, not so much the case. And hey, look, I'm all good with that. Although David Blatt said after the game that it, this was not a uh, maintenance day off. This was not a, a rest, you know, maintenance resting. This was definitely a uh, tweak in the back there. And they wanted to give Kevin Love the night off. Kyrie Irving mispracticed. We talked about it. Oh, no, actually, we didn't. I was just talking to some people off the air. That's right. I wasn't here yesterday. I'm not used to that at all, to be totally honest with you here. By the way, you talk with us right now on Facebook and Twitter, facebook.com slash the sports fix and tweet with us at the sports fix C L E. But Kyrie Irving had the flu. And uh, as I was mentioning, I was joking about the big conspiracy there with that one. Uh, But uh, Kyrie Irving ends up playing after thoughts, maybe that he wouldn't play yesterday. And the Cavs needed that. You know, of course, when you're down a guy, you want to, you want to put up the best game that you can, especially against the Miami heat One fourteen to 88. The Cavaliers win that game last night. And uh, I'll tell you what, man, with the last few games, too, you know, the way the Heat have played, uh, I think important for the Cavs to go ahead and get the victory. They extend that home winning streak to 17 games now. And, uh, man, just... uh, continue wow man that's why that's why as many home games as you can play the better i mean but you know what as far as the your seating and i'm of the agreement i've said this before yeah you'd love to get as many home games as possible especially when you see how well the Cavs have been playing at the queue but if you're a championship team you can win one game on the you need to be able to win one game on the road no matter what so i i'm kind of of that mindset of it you know as far as that goes if you're a if you're a championship team, then you, you can win a game on the road. Although, of course, you'd like to play as many as, as you can at the house in front of your home fans and all that. So, uh, But the Cavaliers, again, last night, make, I don't know if you want to say making statements. They started James Jones last night with some people kind of – you know, shook their shoulders at James Jones, though, able to get out there. And he's got some familiarity, by the way, with the team on the other side. Keep that in mind. But versatility is a, a term that I use when I look at that there. I mean, the ability to go with different looks, go with different uh, groupings. All those things are going to really matter when you get down into matchup time here in the playoffs. And Shump. Good game for him there last night. One of his uh, better games with the Cavaliers, point-wise at least, for sure. He had 17 points, had four steals. Shumpert is always, 
all over the place defensively, as we know, really helping set the tone there, man. Della Vidova, he had his season high with 14 points. He had a couple of steals. Uh, Tristan Thompson, again, just scores a few points in every game. I mean, if you want to pass it to him, he'll go up and get the alley-oop or whatnot. But uh, 15 boards from Tristan Thompson, that's what you want coming off the bench from him. So you saw all the signs. And you know what? And I'm going to get into this with Eddie here in just a minute. My One of my favorite things outside of defense, the defensive side of the ball is just always what gets gets my go going. You know, when they, you get to play in that playoff level defense. But the other thing that I love the most, and you don't see it a lot here, we've seen it more lately, seen a lot of it here, saw some of it against Memphis and some of these Western Conference teams, but loving the LeBron. LeBron didn't even use Utilized the post his first time around in Cleveland. Really, he didn't really begin to developing that, and so many people wanted him to man and just to to add that to his game. And he did work on that and develop it. Did work in the summers with Hakeem Olajuwon down when he was playing with the Heat, and and worked on that. And man, you see them using him more out of the post. There, I mean, that's a weapon there when you start adding those. When you start combining all of these things that we're talking about, and Kevin. Love and Kyrie Irving and all of these these the individual efforts from these other players we mentioned that, that all of that put it together and you're seeing it but you saw this going back to like what I said about Memphis uh, whatever that was a week or week and a half ago about that the way they won the game. It's stuff that's going to come back in the playoffs. It's the style that they're going to play. It's things that are all going to pay dividends here in about a week and a half. Like there, let's pick it up with my man, Eddie Jansen from the Sentinel, the Lake County Sentinel. Eddie Jansen, my man, how you doing today? I'm good. Very happy Friday to you. Happy Easter and ready to talk some Cavaliers as usual. Absolutely, my man. Glad to have you here. Happy Easter weekend coming up here to you, and hopefully you've had a a good last week of things. Cavaliers finally got some rest here, got a big, long stretch of a few days off, and they've got a couple more here as they only play two games in, what, six days here or whatever, and that's good coming off of that crazy run with all the road games and everything and all those tough Western Conference games, a really tough stretch that we looked at going in as a big crucible point of the season there for the Cavs. They've come out of it on the back end now, and it was good to see how they played last night. I mean, you didn't know if Kyrie or Kevin Love were going to end up playing Kyrie Irving, and I love to see uh, that, you know, hey, it's easy to say, hey, we're, we're resting, guys. We're getting ready for the playoffs. Kyrie's got the flu. Kevin Love's out. Both of them are going to sit, and I like to see that personal accountability of Kyrie Irving going, hey, man, there wasn't a chance I wasn't going to play. We got a man down. I've got to get out there and play. You know, obviously, it doesn't even need to be said that in seasons past, Kyrie Irving probably wouldn't have played last night, but j- just again, that's that personal accountability that doesn't just matter last night, but it, it reverberates down on the bench as each player sees other guys sacrifice of themselves they in turn sacrifice of themselves oh sure no question about it jerry and the thing that i like the most uh, is what you're seeing from kyrie irving i mean we know how much he has grown uh, as a basketball player this year you know from the very start in the off season to working with the usa uh, men's basketball team up until now, you know, being one of the uh, you know top uh, twenty or so players in the league, and you know one of the league's best point guards. But um, and, and, you know, I think we do also have to acknowledge the fact that Kyrie has grown as a person this year as well. And you know, like you just touched base with, um, you know, the guys, be, the Cavaliers being a little bit shorthanded and Kyrie stepping up and, and still still playing his brand of basketball, playing the the type of way that we're so accustomed to seeing Kyrie play, uh, you know, really a great thing to see coming down the stretch. And, and really, Kyrie did not look uh, like he had had the fatigue of 70 games in the schedule already. I mean, he looked, you know, pretty fresh out there, you know, dishing the ball out, shooting the ball, uh, being involved in the communication of the team defense. I really like what we've seen from him uh, in the latter portions of the season. 
Absolutely, my man. And I mean, that's just uh, one piece as I talk about it, looking at what I think is going to really be difference makers when you hit the playoffs from previous Cavaliers teams, from previous uh, LeBron James led teams. I mean, whether you're comparing the ones in Cleveland, the ones in Miami, uh, no matter what. And uh, I think that there's just there's different dynamics to this team, different than any team that LeBron or or whatever, however you want to look at it, have led on a championship run. And I look at him and I use him as the, the one that I point to there because that's the one that everybody points to. But uh, what makes this team different is that it by no means uh, does it begin and end there, man. And the dynamics of what's around him are so much different. But his game as well, I was mentioning as I brought you on, uh, Next to defense, the thing that gets me the most excited about watching this team get ready for the playoffs are nights like last night where you watch LeBron really flex some presence and go down in the post and, and really show the, the the additional facet of his game that he definitely did not use hardly at all when he was here before. He didn't really have that that aspect of his game or have confidence in it, but he's definitely developed it over the years. Doesn't always go to it, but when he does, man, that just brings a different dynamic to that offense completely when you got Kyrie and Kevin Love, even though he wasn't out there last night and everybody else. Uh, and Jerry, another thing too, going off of, you know, what I had said about Kyrie Irving, I think the same is true uh, for, for LeBron James. I mean, you did see him post up, a little bit here and there in his years in Miami, and I think probably the number one reason for that was because, you know, other than the, the obvious exception of Chris Bosch, was Miami at that time did not have a true post presence. I think they liked Bosch shooting the ball a little bit more. I think you could say the same thing uh, about Kevin Love here. Uh, you know, going to be interesting to see that once Love uh, it comes back and once he's 100% ready uh, to be back on the floor dealing with the back uh, injury, if LeBron is going to uh, continue to go to the block and try to uh, pick up his offensive rhythm um, there. So, But, you know, again, I think last night was just a, another pristine example of, you know, of Irving and James um, p- picking up a lot of the, the tools that Kevin Love can give to them that was not provided last night because Love didn't play. Um, and you got to love what you're seeing from LeBron as well because really, you know, wherever you put him on the floor, whether it's on the three-point line or in the mid-range game or on the block, LeBron is going to be a dominant player one way or another. But it's good to see him get some more easy baskets as we get closer to postseason play. Well, I mean, it's it, yeah, and I'm with everything you just said, but I mean, also, it's the whole mentality of it. Like, I mean, even Michael Jordan used to do it a lot too. There'd be times where he'd want to make make a statement, prove a point to the guy he would, and you'd see him back his guy down and call for the ball. And I love that. I think it's 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 a it's the mindset. It's aggressive. It's it's just I'm I'm tougher than you. I'm stronger than you. I'm gonna push you around. Whatever, whatever, however you want to describe it. And that's playoff basketball. That is what other players feed off of. I love that man I mean that is that's one side of LeBron that I do enjoy watching is when he when he shears off the veneer and he actually gets a little angry in the game and you start to see that real that that aggression that physical version I, I love that level of play maybe that's maybe it's because I grew up watching those Eastern Conference battle I mean and I know it was an ugly uh, style of basketball but I mean you think of the teams that I grew up watching are the bad boys and then and then Pat Riley's Nick teams that were just thugs they just committed felonies against people in the playoffs and you know what I mean like um and then watching Michael Jordan ha- who is you know my favorite basketball player of all time have to toughen himself up to fight through that because they just beat him down that was the formula to beat him out of the playoffs and but anyways maybe it's because I grew up on that style of basketball that I just uh I don't know man I get my nose up a little bit for some aggressive chippy playoff basketball forget that 104 103 120 122 nonsense. Give me 8179 and and a bunch of elbows in the post. Yeah, and I think it's great to see Jerry uh, to to reinforce your point that LeBron is, is not getting uh, complacent with his two championships. I, I think he's still approaching it that 
um, you know, every game, every time he goes out to the floor, whether it's uh, the first game of the season or, uh, you know, the last game of the finals, he's going out there, uh, you know, with a sense of urgency as well as a sense of, you know, something to prove. Because otherwise, you know, what, why play the game if you don't have something to prove, you know? So I, I, I like the um, post-NBA championship mentality of LeBron having already won two titles, uh, having having that in his repertoire, he's still going out there with something to prove uh, because he knows that this Cavaliers team, uh, while it's got all the tools to win a title, it is still not a a really playoff proven roster. At least not all the pieces being to, together at the same time in the past. So that's a positive sight to see. Uh, for LeBron and, and, and him really continuing to give guys the jitters on the post, put them on the hot seat, and really make them work for stops. For sure. You know what? That is one of the reasons why I've really, in my mind, been hoping, as crazy as this sounds, because I know some people like to, I mean, and I guess I guess I can understand it, start with the easiest path through the playoffs as possible, and, and they want to raise that level of difficulty as each round goes on. Man, I'm kind of of the opposite mindset. I would I would love for the, the Cavaliers to just find themselves smack dab in the middle of the toughest first round series of all the playoff series. And it's because of what you pointed to. I know I heard the guys on the, on the telecast last night. I mean, everybody points to it. It's the fact that these guys, the main guys, Tristan and, and Kyrie and Kevin love, these guys have no zero, no playoff game experience, not even like a one and done in the first round. So I, I totally get that. And that's why I hope that they, whether it's Miami, whether it's Indiana, whether, who knows, Milwaukee slips around, who knows, there's so, it could, Boston could be in there, who knows, there's really so much muddled up around those final couple playoff spots, but I, I want it to be, I want it to be a tough one, I want the Cavs to have to fight to get out of that one, so that, I mean, if anything, the next round is, is easier than the first one, I want them to kind of, it's like a, a, a fast forward, get, get, a, get two rounds of playoff experience in one, Does, I don't know if I'm putting it into words what I mean but I just think the tougher the first round series the better because you have such a lack of seasoning on the other guys well I, I think probably the best way to put it is they don't want to take the first round of the playoffs for granted uh, we know that the Eastern Conference although it's getting better is really not as strong as the Western Conferences I mean you're looking at Oklahoma City you know a team that's been to the Western Conference Finals three times in the last six or seven years, they might not even make the cut this year. Um, but, but you know, as far as the Eastern Conference is concerned, I think that um, when you get young players, um, you know, that have not had playoff experience before, when you get them at a high seed, they tend to get a little bit complacent. Um, and, you know, they might not... Uh, be thinking in the current state of mind, they might be looking ahead as a, a young guy naturally would to, uh, you know, the second round or rounds after that. Um, you know, they just have to stay focused on that round. And, and with what you're saying, Jerry, getting the hardest matchup is going to put them in the mindset of the here and now and not looking ahead to uh, future playoff series, which are in no way, shape, or form guaranteed at all whatsoever. Well, yeah, but and that's that's absolutely a big part of it. But also just the almost like you know combining in just a a pressure of uh, a pressure point of experience for these guys instead of oh this is what the playoffs are like oh okay you kind of roll through that first round instead you know I'd almost I I hope I mean I don't want to say it in the wrong way but I'd love to see guys like Kyrie and Tristan take that first game in the first round for granted and then get woke up real quick and have to win a little five or six game battle you know I again I don't I don't don't see a lot of teams taking them much longer than that but still that's what i like early instead of you know a four and out you know like some of those sweeps that the Cavs teams had in those first round series and then then you'd hit the bump in the road later i'd almost rather that 
first round series be a five or six game dogfight to get out. And you're like, oh, man, good thing we survived. And now those guys are like, damn, now I get what it's like to be in the playoffs rather than it being a round or two before they get their first real playoff level dogfight. You know, speaking of dogfights real quick, have you checked in just the last 24 hours, let alone the last week since you and I talked playoff, the whole East, the bottom of the playoffs has flipped itself around again since we talked last. Milwaukee seems to have at least maybe stemmed the bleeding and got themselves uh, balanced out at six, although they're they're tenuously just two games up there. But look now with last night's game, the Heat now dropped to a tie for eighth, and they, they could find themselves out completely by the time the next 24 hours has passed. Brooklyn's now up in the seventh spot by a half a game. Uh, Miami's now tied with Boston, and now you've got Charlotte and Indiana, who, by the way, just three weeks ago when you and I did this, they had seven and eight locked up at that point, and now they've both fallen completely out, but still, one, two, three, four, five teams all within two and a half games of seven and eight. Yeah, I, I, I did look at the standings a couple of days ago, and, uh, you know, it, going with what you were saying before about the toughest first round matchup. I still think it would be Miami in a lot of ways uh, for a couple reasons. Um, I obviously, a lot of things change uh, with the injury to Wade, and, and I had a pretty good angle on it I yesterday. I originally that. thought it was going to be a groin or a hamstring, uh, something pulled in that regard, but I think they said it was a left knee. But uh, regardless, one way or the other, it did not look good. So it looks as if... Uh, you know, they could be without Dwayne Wade again for a little bit, which and obviously cha- changes the, yeah, the, yeah. the lower seated playoff picture. But, uh, you know, for a lot of different reasons, I still think Miami would probably present the toughest challenge for them, Real with the exception of Milwaukee sliding to seven if the Bucks were going to end up doing that, which I, I, you know, it could happen, although I don't think it will happen. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that weight injury is going to hurt them, no question about it. They, I think that may cost them the playoffs. They're now tied with Boston for that eighth spot, man, and, and you got to figure they're already up against it as it is in their in their injury situation and not having Bosch. I've got to think that losing Wade at all, I mean, I don't think it's even a, well, he'll be back in a couple of weeks. I think if you don't have him for this stretch here, I think Miami may find themselves on the outside looking in from the playoffs when we're all said and done here. Uh, Yeah, I mean, it very well could be. I mean, you know, Wade has not played too many games this year, but when he has played, uh, you know, effectively, he's been very good. He's, He's had several games where he's gone vintage Dwayne Wade, and, you know, with the exception of of acquiring Dragic, I mean, he's still uh, very much so the face of that franchise. And, and yeah, it's very, very possible that, uh, you know, the Wade injury, however serious it is, uh, could cost Miami the playoffs and give uh, the Cavaliers a more favorable matchup in round one. Well, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, again, I don't even I, – I don't know how – Anybody could even speculate who, or the Cavs could even speculate who they may play. I mean, there's really, I mean, I've looked at who everybody's got left to play against and all of that. I mean, I could make a case for any of these five teams finishing seventh and eighth. And like you said, that's not even including Milwaukee, who have done everything they can do to play their way out of the playoffs. And yet somehow they've balanced out at that six spot because I think they've lost eight of 10 twice in the last month. They've just had a couple of really bad streaks uh, ever since, as we talked about, since they changed uh, the makeup of that roster a little bit, man, it didn't, did not go the way they saw things going, but yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be a dog fight down at the bottom. I mean, if the season ended today, it wouldn't even be any of the other teams we've talked about. It'd be Brooklyn who would be the uh, opposition for the, uh, Cavaliers, and to be honest with you, if we're looking at uh, matchups, I think that would potentially be the easiest. And I hate to slight the Nets, but looking at the age and the composition of that roster, I think that would be the easiest one for the Cavaliers, which is the one I'm least interested in, to be honest with you. 
Well, I, I think that no matter who they get in round one, Jerry, and then kind of tying in with what we were saying a, a couple of topics ago, um, I, I think the Cavaliers will go into round one of the playoffs, so even the youngest guys, uh, you know, your Kyrie Irvings and your Tristan Thompsons and your Delavadolas, I think they are, no matter what, going to have a uh, a grounded uh, approach, a down to earth approach, and, what, and when I say that, I mean LeBron James is going to have them mentally ready for the playoffs. I mean, he has been there uh, so many times. He's played well over a hundred playoff games in his career. He's been there and done that before. I think throughout the course of this year, the players know. Um, even the younger ones, they know how difficult it is to win uh, in this league, and they will have uh, a, a down-to-earth mentality come playoff time because they've now played with LeBron James or will have played with him when the time comes for an 82-game season. I mean, these players, they're in the locker room. They know what goes on uh, with LeBron as the ringleader. They know that uh, LeBron has not particularly been the most fond of Kevin Love all season long. We know that Kyrie Irving and LeBron are not uh, best friends in any oh, way, shape, or go. form. Here so I th- <laughs> that in and of itself is going to get the Cavaliers, uh, you know, that, that grounded mentality, that, oh, that, that feeling that, oh, okay, we're not really that good, we still have a lot to prove, and really get them firing on all cylinders uh, in round one and playing at their best potential, even against the below 500 uh, teams competing for postseason play. There you heard it. Start spreading the word now. He was there. He heard them say we're not that good. Now, that's that. he just said it on the show, that, that LeBron looked at David Blatt and said you're not that good. Didn't you just hear it? Didn't you yep, just hear it? Somebody, I'm telling you, that's how that's how they do this stuff. It drives me crazy. You were at the game last night. Come on, Eddie, drop a scoop on us here that we can completely twist out of proportion. Tell me that you saw the cross-eyed look that somebody gave somebody else during the third timeout of the fourth quarter as LeBron was pulling the puppet strings and telling David Blatt what to do. Come on, what did you see? What did you, you know, see? I, I did not see it myself. I know a Come lot on. of my media brethren did. Uh, and, and Blatt was asked about it after the game, but uh, oh. <laughs> to nobody's surprise, he didn't quite address it and kind of uh, not pointed the finger at LeBron, but said, uh, you know, ask him about it. No, no, hold on a second. Come on now. I said this at the beginning of the show. Do guys really think that in 2015, in the league that is described, unanimously as the most players league of them all because of the control that the players have. Do people really think that these guys dribble up and down the court with their head turned over to the sideline and they're directed on what to do on every single play? The game moves entirely too fast for that. There is That is not in any way the way the game works. Somebody want to tell me I'm wrong? Go ahead. But this is the NBA. This is not even college basketball. The I understand you can point me a Popovich. You can point to me to some well-respected coaches. But one of the best things that they do is convince those players that everybody gets along and that they should listen because at the end of the day, every player in the NBA knows that they run this show. And it's the teams that figure out how to convince everybody to work together and respect each other and all of that. They're the ones that are successful. But I just I got to laugh out of that because in general, why would anybody believe that any Anybody who dominate, whether it's the whoever is running the point, whether it's Kyrie Irving, LeBron, whether it's Chris Paul, whether whatever team you want to play for, whoever controls the ball, do you really think that they're told what to do during the fastest moving sport that there is up and down the court? Come on, does Chris Paul look over and wait for somebody to tell him to cross the guy over? Or do they go out there and they run the plays that they practice? And when you time it out, that's when the coaches come in and coach things up. Yeah, I mean there are some some rare exceptions to that. I, I think you'll get a little bit more of that in playoff basketball when the when the possessions become bigger and everything True. becomes more True. meaningful. Yes. And you know, like you had mentioned, there are a couple of uh, we'll say personalities uh, from the coaching standpoint in the league where there are a couple of exceptions where they actually will call plays from the sidelines. But 
Yeah, I mean, why make a big deal out of this when we know that LeBron James has has called plays even in his first stint uh, uh, in Cleveland, with the exception of of his rookie year and just not knowing the NBA all that well from year two until now year 12. LeBron's been the obvious ringleader. I mean, I, I don't think it's a big deal at all. This is this really should not uh, come as news to anybody. Eddie Jansen, I have a question for you. I have a question for everybody out there. Wendy, I got a question for the fans. I want to know what is the difference. Somebody tell me what is the difference because every single thing that has been attached to David Blatt and LeBron. And look, man, at the beginning of the season, the dynamics were different. It took a while for things to get together, and I, I did not I did not like the way LeBron approached the first quarter of the season. Regardless, everybody can point to that and say he has been a different player. So it's not like he didn't change and everybody else did. He changed his approach. Everybody else changed. The results got better. And most importantly, the team made a couple of very, very important trades. But I go back to, like you said, not only was this the same thing that happened before, it's the same thing that happens ever. And listen, I think you misunderstood me. Every coach calls plays during the game from the sideline. It happens all the time, but they don't call every play. They call plays when the game slows down and there's a chance to look over. But when it's a, a back and forth, run and gun type, you know, in those scenarios, a lot of times the players are playing on the fly. Uh, I did not in any way. I mean, of course, every coach calls certain plays from the sideline. But, but going back to what I was saying, how does these exact same things happen and Eric Spolstra is voted coach of the year and they happen to David Blatt and he's the biggest idiot in the world who's being led around by his nose and LeBron James is the puppet master. But when the exact same things happen in Miami, Eric Spolstra is the best coach in the NBA. How the hell does that happen? Uh... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I'm just as puzzled as you are in that regard, <laughs> Jerry. I, I wish I knew. I, I really, I, I wish I can tell. I wish I could tell you. I, you know, uh, maybe it's the rookie head coach thing. Maybe it's the uh, never had uh, much of anything to do in the He's NBA as David Blatt too. has. Maybe it's that. Um, you know, there are a lot of conspiracy theorists out there. That thought I'll that Pat Riley was you really wanna, calling the no, shots and that Spolstra was just a puppet. I don't know. I, I have no idea what it is. I do. But you want you a know. conspiracy? The conspiracy is is that LeBron plays in Cleveland now, and that's the problem. That is the problem. LeBron doesn't play in New York, Miami, L.A., Chicago, any of the pretty places that they wanted him to go. He came back to Cleveland, and so the national media is aghast at the fact that LeBron went back to Cleveland. You know, we have to keep going back to Cleveland to cover this guy. And I honestly believe that's the biggest difference because all of these things were happening, brother. My man was shoulder blocking Spo coming off the bench in his first season. They were ready to put Pat Riley back on the sidelines. I very much, I think some people have selective memory. You need to go back four years ago and look at that first season of Spo and LeBron and you will see daily headlines. Google is great for archiving stuff. You can go find daily headlines from there from Miami's point of view that you could just change the words Blatt and Sposter out and have the exact same headline happen in today in 2015. Remember when he when he did the shoulder, everybody was he was gone. Pat Riley was coming down. Now where Pat Riley stepped in was he said, look guys, I gotta let you know I'm not gonna be the coach. You guys need to figure out how to make it work with Spo because I'm not gonna be the coach. And eventually it worked out. But I would laugh all four years when people would say Eric Spolstra should be the coach of the year and I'm like, okay. I mean, as much as Mike Brown should have been the coach of the year. You know, I guess that's what you want to say. But same stuff happens here, and David Blatt is the village idiot. And I just believe that part of it is because the national media doesn't appreciate the fact that LeBron James is playing in Cleveland and not Miami or some other media headlining place. Yeah, I I would not be surprised in the least. I mean, uh, (laughs) you don't really need me to to tell you that Cleveland you know, is not exactly a uh, a destination for any type of travelers, whether it be vacation goers or ESPN reporters or, or what have you. But yeah, I mean, uh, when, whenever something gets inconvenient, 
uh, you know, for the members of the media. Yeah, things can get a little wacky and a little out of hand. So yeah, I mean, this this doesn't this doesn't surprise me at all. It's unfortunate. I, I do think that Blatt is is a really good coach and a great basketball mind, although relatively unproven in the NBA, even in his first year. But um, who, who knows? I, I, this is going to subside eventually once they start winning playoff games and everybody starts taking uh, a share of the credit of the Cavaliers' success. But for now, I mean, I, I guess we're just looking for something to talk about come playoff time because we know that the Cavaliers are going to finish uh, with the second seed, and it's just a matter of time before we get to postseason play. So, That's right. You know, I said at the beginning of the show, it's this novel concept for those of you that may not have, you know, maybe you just joined the basketball world in the last four or five years, but around this time of year, the 16 best teams get together and they like to continue playing when the season ends. And I know this is a new thing here in Cleveland, but we're going to participate in this little activity here this year and see if we can have some fun too. And I'm all about it. And if people think that Wendy and these guys are blowing up stories now, I said it at the beginning of the show, my brother, and you know it as good as anybody. You think that stories are being blown out of proportion now? Wait until the playoffs when there's 48 hours between every game and every cross cross look between Kevin Love and LeBron James is now being isolated on Sports Center. They're looking at it from 16 different angles. Chris Webber comes on to tell you what he thinks about it. Jalen Rose comes on to tell you what he thinks about it. Chris Broussard is going to tell you what he thinks about it. You know what I mean? You ain't seen nothing yet when you talk about drama and the Cavs. Wait until they're in the playoffs. Yeah, that that's going to be a ride. I mean, you know, that, that is really going to be a ride. That's going to that's really going to take us and this city back to <laughs> that, that that first moment in July when when LeBron made his decision on that Friday morning that he was going to going to return to Cleveland and I think you let that settle in for about 5 minutes. Just you just give it 5 minutes to settle in, Jerry, and you're already thinking ahead to April and May and June of, of 2015. So essentially what we will have done in the next couple of weeks is gone from, uh, we'll have revisited July when LeBron essentially laid down the foundation to come back to set up the big three and then fast forward it all the way to April because that's what we've been awaiting. That's what Cleveland needs. They need a championship. And you know everybody knows that if LeBron does not bring a championship to Cleveland in in year number two, this return is more or less going to be for nothing. It's a very unique situation still to have uh, LeBron be the, the superhero and the savior that everybody thought he was going to be, but he has to win that championship, and that's what everybody's going to constantly put under the microscope and every tiny little microscopic detail uh, is really going to be crucified by the national media here. I guarantee you guys, after the first tough playoff loss, you will hear unidentified sources on ESPN telling you that Kevin Love and or LeBron James may not be returning to the Cavaliers after what just happened. I, I, there will be closed door arguments that have been heard by unnamed sources and I'm telling you, Kevin Love will be seen stomping angrily out of the locker room after a tough playoff loss, vowing never to return. I'm, you just wait. You ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, let's see. Eddie, as we get ready to hey, by the way, got another big one here. Uh, uh, I know you try not to talk about them being statements but man there's a couple of chances here to make final ones got the bulls coming up here and obviously Cavs looking to defend that 17 game home winning streak make it 18 and and maybe make a little bit of a statement there heading into the playoffs oh sure sure absolutely i mean a nationally televised game on a holiday on easter sunday right. and, and really jerry when you look back at it these were the two teams the Cavs and the bulls that most yeah. people thought were going to meet in the Eastern Conference Finals. Now, obviously, a lot has changed since that time, in, heavily in favor of the Cavs with the trades and then the uh, the injury to Derrick Rose. But uh, stay tuned on that because Rose, I, I think, was – something happened with Rose the other day. I think he was cleared to – participate in contact drills or or maybe he you know stepped on the floor and was shooting some 
some jump shots for like a half hour before a game or something like that. But Rose essentially did make a step in the right direction. Now all of the pieces falling into place for, uh, you know, I think inevitably one way or another, Cleveland is going to meet Chicago. That's their nemesis. That's, you know, the Bulls really outside of Miami, which obviously no longer exists because of Big Three split up, that the Bulls have been the most uh, stabilizing factor in the Eastern Conference. That's going to be a team that the Cavaliers are going to want to take down. The number one team that the Cavaliers are going to want to take down, obviously now with the exception of Atlanta. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun there for the Cavs and the Bulls and Cavs fans everywhere. A little Easter Sunday edition of some possible playoff preview basketball should be a lot of fun. And actually, for all intents and purposes, should the Cavaliers win this game, uh, they'll, they won't lock up the number two seed per se because Toronto will still be able to, I guess if Toronto won out and the Cavs lost out, Toronto could take it. But for all intents and purposes, they knock Chicago out of contention for number two, and they put Toronto up against the brink where really, for all intents and purposes, the Cavs lock up the number two seed with a victory there. They definitely eliminate Chicago from contention for the number two seed. So it's another reason to go out there too because the quicker you lock it up, then you can rest guys for a couple games. The last thing you want to do is have to be actually trying hard until the last game because you want to lock up that number two seed. And I don't mean trying hard. I don't mean that like people I get it, you know, people got to get their money's worth, but you do want to rest a couple of guys and it gets harder to do that if you have to win until the last game or two. Well, yeah, I think the reason you don't want to sit guys for the last game or two or three is because it's just too close to the playoffs. I think you'd rather rest them in late March or early April, give them a couple games to get back into the swing of things, and then try to ride that momentum uh, you know, into postseason play. So you know, still a little bit of work to be done, but it looks like the Cavaliers will be – uh, statistically the second best team in the East, but really over the second half of the season, there's no question about it that the Cleveland Cavaliers have been the most dominant team uh, in the Eastern Conference. You have to give credit to Atlanta because they started out hot, uh, and, and that's what, maybe that's why we call them hot Atlanta. But, uh, you know, for, for the most part, the Cavaliers in the second half with the new pieces they have are the team to beat uh, in that conference. Absolutely. And Eddie, of course, you know, a little quick switch off, talk about the Cavs, their season winding down. Monday, Tribe getting ready. Are you ready for some baseball, man? Tribe starting things on Monday. Uh, yeah, I, I cannot believe it. It's going to be another season and the home opener on Friday. That's yeah. going to be another something special, uh, particularly there? because of the changes uh, to the stadium in, in, in an attempt to try to. Uh, increase uh, ticket sales and revenue and, and try to get more attendance, people coming to the game. But uh, it could be a special season for the Indians, and uh, really excited for it. Absolutely. you going to be down there for the home opener? I, I am planning on it. Oh, I am God. planning on being there. I'll be there as well. We're going to have to get together. My man, Eddie Jansen from the Lake County Sentinel, talking some calves and getting ready for opening day for the Tribe next week. We'll have a couple more behind us, and we'll be uh, – Shoot, we'll just by the time we talk next week, there'll be about three, four games left in this uh, regular season. Yeah, unbelievable. Talk to you soon, Jer. You got it. My man, Eddie Jansen from the Lake County Sentinel, here every week on the Sports Fix. Let's take a break, get you some news, and get my man Jeff Gorman in on the conversation, talking Indians. Let's preview the season with Jeff, see where he's at. As we now know, by the way, 25th man in the books, Austin Adams is that guy. Jesus Aguilar sent down here while I was on my little respite this week from the show. We'll talk about that, and we'll get Jeff's feelings here heading into the season, maybe talk a little Browns too, whatever we feel like getting into with Jeff Gorman. He writes for Indians and Browns 101.com. He's here every Tuesday and Friday. Today's Friday, so that means coming up next, it's the news. Then Jeff Gorman joins us here on the Sports Fix. <laughs> The 
Sports Fix, your choice for intelligent talk. That was wonderful. Bravo. I loved that. That was great. Uh, intelligent talk. Well, it was pretty good. Well, it wasn't bad. Well, there were parts of it that weren't very good. It could have been a lot better. I didn't really like it. These guys must be on the wrong station. It was pretty terrible. It was bad. It was awful. I was terrible. Get them away. Hey, boo. Boo. The Sports Fix. Sports Fix listeners, do you tweet? So do we. So tweet with us 24-7 at the Sports Fix CLE. How to be a great dad in 15 seconds. Bike ride, go fish, walk in the park, phone call, milkshake, play catch, picnic, fly a kite, tell jokes, laugh, talk, read a story, tell a story, bumper car, swing set, bowling, pillow fight, cut loose, stay tight. Because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Have you gotten your copy of Cleveland's Finest yet? Highlighting the best moments, players, and media members in Cleveland sports history? In-depth, personal interviews with some of the top names in Cleveland sports fill the pages of this incredible book. Cleveland's Finest by Vince McKee is this year's must-have book for every Cleveland sports fan. Available now at Amazon.com. Copy today. Business owners and professionals, do you want to take your business, your product, your team, your event to the next level? You want to advertise right here with the Sports Fix. Our listeners are among the most loyal listeners, terrestrial or internet. The Sports Fix universe is not only the radio show, but tens of thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter. Email me, Jerry Myers, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. That's the Sports Fix at AOL.com. And let me help you swing for the fences and hit it out of the park right here on the Sports Fix. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Harry Buffalo. Harry Buffalo, join the herd. News break. Good morning, I'm Bob Picosi. Four teams will be seeking a national championship this weekend in Indianapolis, but one will also be seeking history. 38 no Kentucky to become the first team to finish undefeated in 39 years. Coach John Calipari's Wildcats will meet Wisconsin in the second semifinal tomorrow night. Because the talent level is what it is, I think we're all just worried about our own teams playing well. We're not going to control what Wisconsin does. They're going to play the way they play. I just hope my team plays well. It will be a rematch of last year's semifinal. Kentucky won that one by a point. Stanford squandered a 13-point second-half lead but hung on to beat Miami 66-64 in overtime. In the NIT championship game last night in New York, Chase and Randall led the way with 25. He's turned down offers to coach UCLA, North Carolina State, and Illinois, but Shaka Smart is leaving VCU to become the new coach at Texas. He coached the Rams to a Final Four appearance in 2011. The Golf Channel is reporting that Tiger Woods is working on his game today at the practice facility at Augusta National. That's where the Masters begins next Thursday. Today's second round, Shell Houston Open. The leaders are Sean Stefani and Scott Piercy at 9-under. Sometimes it's easy to see a difference, and sometimes it's not. Valvoline Full Synthetic High Mileage with Max-like technology is different, and you can see why at seeadifference.com. Valvoline, 140 years under the hood. You're listening to The Sports Fix. Oh, my God, it's him. Crank it, Jerry. Welcome back to The Sports Fix Live. J-Rock rolling on here with you guys. Jeff Gorman getting ready to join us here. We're going to talk a little... Indians baseball as we prepare to preview the season. Thanks to Eddie Jansen from the Lake County Sentinel joining us here. Last segment talking some Cavs hoops, playoff previews, and a little Indians getting warmed up here, ready to go. We're going to pick that up again with Jeff to Tribe. <laughs> Tribe sent me an email. It's great, actually. Uh, I can't get out there because I'll be on the air with you guys. But Monday, go down and check out the, uh, the media preview of everything that's uh, – fresh and rebuilt over at progressive field unfortunately it's dead smack in the middle of us doing the uh doing the sports fix but it, the, the headline is see what's new at progressive field this year and you know what i want to see that's new is those fans back in those seats because i'm telling you 
there there's gonna be a a good down at the corner of Burnaby and Ontario, you guys. I'm telling you, it's not the it's not the Cleveland or any, it's not the glasses or anything like that, man. I'm telling you, this is a for whatever like dislike, whatever for previous regimes, the ownership, the front office, whatever. This is a team that has a solid core going for its third consecutive winning season. And I know that some people are not as high as others. You know, Mike Brandenberry sees the same as last season. I will say that, say what you want, three consecutive successful seasons is better than two, and that's another step above. I see a little bit more than that. And again, it's not much difference. I mean, really, they, we're talking the difference between 85, 86, 88, 89. I've got the Indians at 89, 90 wins, and I think that that is enough to win this division here. I don't have them at 95, 96 wins at some what I think is a pie-in-the-sky total. I think that's very realistic. I just think that much like last season, that's around the win total that it's going to... Hell, last season, it turned around to, to be a lower win total to get into the wild card as well. So, But I'm not even looking that way, just looking at the division. But in general, it's going to be a good feeling. I'm telling you, I don't want to be... Forget that complaining about the fans and nobody's going out. I understand it takes a while. It's not going to be full houses in this in the early part of the season those aren't all excuses some of those things are real reasons why it takes a little bit to warm up no pun intended but man there's no reason why bruce said in the chat room there i was going to bring this up here but a slight increase in the season ticket sales it's not a ton but it's up from 8000 going into last season to a hair over 9000 this year and and as a simple way to point out what a difference that makes it doesn't sound like a ton you go oh you know a thousand or 1200 more big deal multiply that by 81 and all of a sudden you've added six figures to the total number of people that go through the turnstiles and that's a big difference maker right there just that little bit let alone uh, if you jump more but that shows a little something it stems the tide of down because that's what the, the season ticket sales have been and I'll go with Dan I still think that there needs to be a major up upgrade and overhaul of this the way they approach their season ticket sales but as bruce said group ticket sales are up too and i think you'll see a lot more of that too that's one of the things the tribe was aiming for with the re restructuring of places they they wanted more open concourses open spaces places to take pictures and and congregate in groups and because they know that groups is a big thing it's a lot a lot less of the individual people going down and a lot more of groups of people going down and making a social activity out of it. Uh, and Bruce works in the ticket office for the Indians. He also says a lot more uh, sales of 10 and 20 game ticket packages as well, which to me, that's the natural growth is if I'm not willing to go out on the ledge for the Dolans on a season ticket commitment, that's where you would get me. I would make a 10 or 20 game package and, and then earn the trust back and then Perhaps that person gets a half season package or or whatever or splits a season ticket package with another people, a, a group of people or or so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, but anyways, a, a slight increase is just that. And I do hope that not because I don't want to be railing about fans in the seats because I want to have some damn fun this summer. And you have a whole lot more fun when you heard that music as we came in. You have a whole lot more fun when somebody says crank it, Jerry, and you play that music and 30. 5,000 people are swaying back and forth and singing wild thing than if it's only 9,000. And it's just a bad karaoke night. We get 35,000 in there, it's Major League Four, which is, I don't know, I'm just saying, I think three was the last one, that awful one, by the way, that we try to pretend didn't exist. Let's pick up there, talk about all of this. You guys keep the conversation going on Facebook and Twitter, facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix, C L E, email us the sports fix at AOL.com. I'm going to the phones. You can't be there because that's where my man Jeff Gorman resides right now. He writes for Indians101.com. Jeff, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing superb, J-Rock. There's all sorts of fun stuff going on. This is always one of the best weekends of the whole year, you know, with the Final Four coming in and Major League Baseball getting started. And, of course, for us, we have the bonus of the Cavs doing so well and everybody get pumped up for the playoffs. So this is really an exciting time right now. 
Oh, absolutely, man. I'm fired up. If you can't tell, I'm feeling good this weekend, especially, you know, as I, as I said, you got all these things. You, you just hit it. You, all these things come together. Monday, baseball season gets started, man. Spring training coming to an end here. Last couple of games uh, here today and tomorrow and then uh, travel day and then boom, there we go. Kick things off on Monday. Uh, how are you feeling after after this whole uh, spring training and all the things that we've seen? What's your a change, maybe good or bad, up or down from where you were till now through the spring, what you've seen from the tribe? Well, I think that I've got a little bit more confidence in the Indians just based on what's happened in spring training, simply because nothing disastrous has happened. I mean, nobody's leg has fallen off. You know, it's not like we had all these expectations, but then here's a couple of big bumps in the road. In fact, quite the contrary, just the fact that Brandon Moss has looked so good, and he looks like he's ready to come in, and he seems to be healed up, and he's ready to provide that power in the middle of the lineup. That's a big difference from last year, and that's one of the little lynch that you can think of, well, this is a real reason why I think the Indians are probably going to be better than, than last year, and that's a, that's a big deal. <laughs> I still can't believe, well, in a way, I can believe that Oakland would trade him. As much as it caused me to tear my remaining hair out last year when they made that stupid Yoannis Cespedes trade, I'm just glad that they kept the stupidity going to trade Brandon Moss to us. Absolutely, and I think that is going to be uh, unheralded. It won't be soon, but I think it, it it will be the one that slipped under so many people. I I got to be honest with you. I mean, I could probably I could I don't know. I want to say count on one hand because it was a, a few, but it was a small percentage of Indians fans that were cool with the acquisition of Brandon Moss. The majority of people were very negative and the, the middle ground people were, well, maybe if he bounces back. There were very few people that were like, hey man, this this is, this is going to be a good deal. And I understand not being sure if he was going to bounce back, but uh, you know, the majority of people even then were like, eh, yawn, you know, it's, it's another bargain basement, Dolan sign that was probably the biggest one that I got mostly. And I'm like, man, I'm telling you, uh, if this guy is is right. And I mean, and I know we're used to in Cleveland, you know, a guy's injury lasts for the rest of his life, apparently, because I, no, because the way fans look at it, no, only in Cleveland can a guy get injured and never in his whole life is he ever able to recover from it. Because right. I'm like, hey, man, like, uh, what is it that hard to believe that he can he can bounce back? But I knew that if he did, Man, I said, man, this this guy in this lineup, I like him. I remember, I remember liking him more than most people did when we signed him. But of course, he did have to show that he was healthy, and so far, uh, he really has. And uh, man, that to me, backing him up with Martinez, or excuse me, Martinez with Santana. I wish <laughs> Martinez. I was thinking, I was going oh, yeah. another. Well, no, I was going to talk to you about the Tigers here in a minute. But backing him up with Santana there and Santana's ability to draw walks and or uh, take advantage of mistakes by the pitcher. A, he's going to get on base a lot. B, he's going to have a, a much fatter selection of pitches to see because not a, not a lot of pitchers are going to be big on putting him on base so they can face Brandon Moss. And then Brandon Moss is going to get a fat pitch selection to see because he's been able to sit through longer at bats of Carlos Santana and see more pitches. And I just think there's a lot of synergy in the Indians lineup. I I disagree with Mike Brandenberry as far as he sees a lot of nights again like last year where you have, you know, a feast or famine with the lineup. I I see a more consistent one through a, one through nine lineup here for the tribe. Well, I think so, too, and a lot is going to depend on everybody's health. I mean, you don't want a repeat of, of last year where you have Swisher hurt and you have Kipnis banged up and you have Bourne, you know, in and out. If you can, I mean, this is a very good lineup if these guys can stay on the field. And like you said, they can give synergy, they can help each other one through nine, especially with Bourne at the top. I mean, he just sets everything up, and he's, he hasn't really been going crazy with stolen bases. In fact, he's barely even tried any stolen bases in the uh, spring training, but if he can just get on base and just cause havoc, then that's really going to help, especially if, you know, Kipnis can just get back to his old self. I, I feel the way, even though it didn't really work out last year, I feel that this is really much more of a slump-proof lineup than it was last year. I mean, last year, that's what I thought coming in, and yet it was not slump-proof at all. But 
I mean, if they can stay healthy and if you really can get the best out of this group, you know, I think that they're not all going to hit every night, but overall, one through nine, they're going to come through with, of course, Brantley, and of course, Jan Gomes always seems to come up with the timely hits at the right time, and um, and then you have Hall just always kind of lurking in the shadows, ready to come up with some uh, surprising power, and I think that, like we said last week, the fact that we have stability on the corners now, where Hall knows he's going to be there, Santana knows he's going to play first base, and he's not trying to learn some other group position, I think that as long as, I really tell this really the big thing here. If this group can stay healthy, they can really go far. But if we have injuries again, then that's going to be a problem. You know, slump proof, that's a good word. That's kind of the way I see it. Everybody's going to go through it, but I just think that there's more balance. And I think that there's more There's more pop, there's more power. I like, and you brought up Bourne, that's another guy, man. I really... I, I don't care what his stats say, which they look good in the spring, but I don't care about that. Just the eye test for me. Uh, he looks like Mike said, you know, what he said the other day, I can kind of uh, get on board with. At the very least, I think you're going to see the 2013 version of Michael Bourne, which, again, is not what you necessarily signed up for. But that is an upgrade worlds over what you had, you know, previous or the following season. And, uh, you know, maybe he doesn't touch what he did before that, but I think you're going to see the best Michael Bourne this year that we've seen now, you know what that is. You, you can tell me if it's worth what we're paying him or not, but I do think you're going to see, he just seems like, like he's better, like he's right. And I, and that's going to go a big way. You know what, uh, too? Mike said the other day, I can't wait to get him on next week. Because, and I know one play is not one to uh, to lean your hat on. But I remember him saying right. the other day, uh, well, Michael Bourne's not suddenly going to turn into the best center fielder in baseball and magically make all these plays. But he made a pretty decent one where you're like, man, you know what? He's covering a little bit of ground out there. I'm just saying, I'm feeling really good about Michael Bourne. I said that at the beginning of spring after about a week or two and here four or five weeks later i'm i'm right there i'm still feeling really confident about michael Bourne. yeah i think that if you talk about who are maybe the two or three most important players of the year i think Bourne has got to definitely be in that top three simply because of how unique he is on the team he's not a unique person in all of baseball but as far as the indians go you know having that kind of speed and the ability to cover ground in the outfield and steal bases we don't have a whole lot of those guys on the team. In fact, you might have to go all the way down and pick up, you know, Tyler Holt if something happens to Bourne. <laughs> but this team has a lot of guys in the right fielder DH category, and that's not even counting Nick Swisher. That's where, you know, Moss and David Murphy and Ryan Rayburn are going to be. So we have a lot of those kind of guys, but not a whole lot of guys like Michael Bourne, and that's one of the main reasons why he's so important to this team and why we just really have to hope that he can stay healthy for most if not all the season, I think that's going to set up everything else. If Chipness can come back as well, then I think we're going to be in really good shape because I feel really good about the guys in the middle with Brantley and Santana and Gomes and Moss. And, and, and to be honest, you know, I I mentioned this the other day. I don't get it where a, all the question marks about Kipnis. For Kipnis, yeah, he missed that stretch of games. And a lot of people, including myself, are like, okay, I hope this is uh, airing on the side of caution. And it appears that it was because other than that, he has hit the ball so well. He's hitting to all fields. He's showing a little power. He's showing... I'm telling you, man, I, there's another one that I feel pretty good about heading into the season. And, I mean, those those three right there, if those three guys are right, we aren't even getting into Nick Swisher yet, who who is, again, progressing at least to where we may get a positive contribution out of him this year on the Indians. At least the potential is there. They're willing to take their time and do it right. But those three guys, Kipnis, Bourne, Moss, if – the way I feel in my gut, and I think a lot of the guys that I'm talking to, like yourself, if those three are right, the Indians are going to go a long way this season. And I got a feeling that they are. It just feels like offensively. Maybe the problems now then flip over to the pitching side because you can't get it right everywhere. But I do feel offensively much more confident about this team. And if those three guys are right, I will say this. If those three guys are doing what I think they're going to do this year, the Indians are going to have one of the better offenses in the American League. I think you're right, and of course the pitching is going to back that up. I mean, obviously you can't know everything until they get out on the field and play, but just, you know, especially in baseball, baseball is definitely a game where you can look at a player's track record and kind of 
sort of predict what they're going to do as long as their you know body stays intact. Right. So I think that the the Indians have enough hitters who have hit at the major league level. It's not like we've got guys who have only been up in the show for one year, and it's like, well, they had a good year. But these are guys who have four or five years of showing what they can do. So that's why, and, you know, of course, really it's the pitching side where you have, you know, some good results, but really not as much of a track record. So, right. I mean, I'm hoping that, you know, that's really the situation where the pitching staff needs to prove a little bit more that they can do it. And, of course, if those guys live up to their potential, then we're in really good shape because there are teams out there that are shelling out tens of millions of dollars for good starting pitching, and we have a, I wouldn't say completely homegrown, but a completely cheap pitching staff that's going to be right up there with them, especially the way Zach McAllister is. He's had a fantastic spring, and I just love how he's played himself onto this team and just grabbed a spot in the rotation, and that's going to make everybody else better. Oh, absolutely, man. Now, you know, you're talking pitching. We'll flip over there. And, and you know what, too? I, you know what? Before we go there, because we, we hit a lot of things as we go back and forth, and uh, uh, brushing by them is something easy to do. Another thing that you mentioned in there that I don't want to look past is, of course, defensively. And I thought you brought up a lot of the reasons that I think you'll see uh, offensively guys like Santana settle down by that and switch in positions. And, again, uh, I, I agree with Mike Brandenberry from Did the Try Win Last Night dot com. I do not in any way think that the Indians jump up near the top, even the top half, top three fourths of the league. But I I am in that category of people that agrees uh, a little differently with Mike that if they can just simply improve to that twenty one through twenty four ranking, even just get out of that that bottom fourth of the league, I think that's enough to uh, to nullify what they did last year. I mean, they're still they're never going to bring up shades, as I say. There's not a Brooke Robin, Brooks Robinson at every position here, but they're 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 going to be better and that to me is enough of a gap but you know again we're only that sounds pitiful to go i'm just hoping for below average instead of you know anything better but we'll see man i mean uh defensively uh, in the spring ha, ha, from what you've seen and granted every day is not on tv every day hasn't been uh videoed i've been able even on the days that weren't to see the highlights and the videos but uh, what about defensively i mean do you still have a, a lot of the same concerns obviously you'll still see just and Hall boot a ball from time to time. You'll see Kipnis butcher a ball here and there. But uh, are, how are you feeling from what you've seen defensively in the spring from these guys? Well, I don't see anything too, too terrible. I mean, if there's one person who is, you know, suspect, it's going to be Chisholm Hall. Yeah. But I don't think that from all throughout the, the, uh, the team – out in the field that there's a lot of, of problems. I mean, last year, I think, really was an aberration. And you could tell just in the second half of the season that, you know, they were starting to pick it up. They weren't really losing a lot of games on defense the way they were. And, you know, that is possibly the difference between missing the playoffs. I mean, it was just didn't miss the playoffs by much. And just having horrible defense in the first half just really sunk us. And I think that, you know, I just don't see that happening again. It's just the way baseball is. Sometimes you start a season and your bullpen suddenly completely falls apart. And like, wait a minute, I thought these guys were good. No, they can't get anybody out. It's one of those unpredictable things in baseball that is sometimes, you know, the bottom can just fall out of a certain aspect of the team, in this case being the defense. And, you know, it's not anything you can, because we were trying last year, what can we do? How can we fix this? And you just have to sort of wait for it to get better because there's not like one or two guys that are like, well, if this person's the problem, let's replace them. So I think that the defense, like you said, might not be superb, but I think it's not going to be as big a problem as it is last year, and I don't think it's going to affect a whole lot of different players. That's kind of where I'm at, you know, and I was just curious where you were with what you've seen, not even just what we're projecting, but what you've actually seen, because that's just it, too. I haven't watched a team and went, boy, I'm embarrassed to, to call these guys a baseball team. They can't field a ground ball. Like, it felt like it sometimes last year, you know, but, uh, right. but you know, we'll see. And then the other thing, now, segue in from there into the pitching, because you brought up two things. Number one, of course, you've got the starters, and everybody – Points at what they did in the second half of last season. 
I've got my own thoughts. Obviously, that's not all going to carry over like that. I disagree with people wanting to see, uh, well, can Corey Kluber, uh, he only had one. I don't agree that he only had one good year. I think he's had, uh, obviously, he didn't make the team coming out of camp two years ago, but uh, he came up, he had a run, he pitched very well. Then the next season, you wanted to see if he could follow it up. And then he had the Cy Young season. So to me now, it's it's... There is more of a track record. I'm not sitting here going, well, let's see what he can do. It's just a matter of can he do it at that level again. But I think he's going to be uh, just fine either way. Uh, Carlos Carrasco, too, as much as I want to hold my my bets on him for a couple of starts and see what he does, I really do got a feeling that what we saw was for real because in the spring, and it's a mirage, you can get fooled by the spring, but... Uh, in the spring, he definitely looked like he has not missed a beat. Where with other guys, you could see that it's a work in progress. With him, it was, man, I really got the feeling that this really did carry over. Whatever he figured out about himself did carry over. I've still got questions and concerns about Trevor Bauer. I've got questions about how the rest of this rotation is going to continue to fall in, like McAllister, like House. I want to see what they do, but uh, Carrasco, I think, is all right. So I think no matter what, one and two is going to be good, consistent all season long for the tribe. Three, four, five is where the depth is going to be tested. Can we see what they do? And the other thing you mentioned is the bullpen. The how do they handle a lot of guys working a lot of innings last year, especially guys like Shaw. Now, you know, matter of fact, there was just a big uh, write up in the Plain Dealer about that, about how the reason that the Indians aren't concerned is Terry Francona makes sure that he doesn't warm up guys and then not use them and warm up guys and wear them down too much. It's okay to use them 65, 70, 80 times if Every time they get up, they pitch. But if you're getting them up 20 games and then using them another 80, all of a sudden you've really worn those guys down. That makes some sense. But can the bullpen hold up this season? Or is this the season where you go, man, the strength of the team last year now becomes a weakness? That worries me. And 3-4-5, how that falls out in the rotation. But I... Oh, famous last words. I am convinced that I think Carlos Carrasco really has turned a corner, and I think one and two are going to be rock solid for the Tribe this year. Well, I think so, too. I mean, you can just tell that Carrasco seems to be knowing what he's doing. You know, since spring training, we're going to see him pitch today against uh, Milwaukee, yeah. and you know, it's like it's like uh, the previous year when Ubaldo Jimenez had that great run down the stretch. Like, wow, is this the real guy? Is this... Uh, what he's, what he's going to do all the time, and obviously the answer turned out to be no. And fortunately, that didn't end up biting the uh, the Indians. But I think that uh, Carrasco uh, is going to have things uh, really a lot more under control. And, you know, he might not be super consistent the way Kluber's going to be, but I think that as long as he can stay healthy, you know, just put up all... This is going to be his first full season as a starting pitcher at the major league level. I think that even if he's not perfect, he's definitely, you know, a good candidate to get at least 14, 15 wins, and that's, you know, really good for another number two uh, pitcher, and he talked about the bullpen, and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be tricky, because as we saw last year, you know, Frank Hona, he really had, you know, certain bullpen guys that he could trust, and that he really were his go-to guys. I mean, Atchison, you know, who's getting a little bit on in years, and of course, using Shaw a lot, and then uh, Allen. It's going to be interesting to see if some of these other bullpen guys, uh, guys like Crockett and Hagedon and uh, people like that, maybe even Swarzak, can start to earn his trust so that, you know, Frank Hona can be comfortable going to those guys uh, and being able to stretch them out. Because when you have a situation like this where the Indians have a real chance of, you know, going somewhere, you're going to need your bullpen to be not just, you know, healthy, but, you know, sharp in September and maybe even October. So you really want to make sure you stretch these guys out so that they have some gas in the tank when you get down the stretch. You're listening to the Sports Fix. Jeff Gorman, Indians101.com writer, joining us here. We're talking a little bit of tribe, looking ahead to the season. And uh, 
happened. You know, I'll tell you what, talking about that article in the uh, in the Plain Dealer uh, that they did the other day, looking at the, uh, or perhaps this was just done yesterday, looking at the bullpen specifically, uh, they go back and look at the Indians, because this is where, you, you know, I mentioned that uh, a bullpen can go fickle very quickly, and, uh, and much like a football team can age overnight, uh, you look at the Indians for the past 10 years, the, the, the back and forth on the Indians bullpen, and most years, it's almost a back and forth effort, you know, 2004. The bullpen ERA was a 4.9. The following season, it was nearly cut in half. It was a 2.8. 2006, they bounced back to a 4.73. 2007, it drops back down almost a full run to a 3.75. And this pattern continues. A 5.1 in 08, a 4.66 in 09. 3.8 3.8 in 2010, 3.7. A little bit of consistency there between 10 and 11. Hello. But that was very much the same bullpen carried over. And it's rare that you get, as you see, the consistency from one year to the next. It's almost always the counter of what you got the year before. 2012, it jumped back up to four runs a game. 2013, 3.6. And then, of course, last year, an excellent 3.1 ERA. But uh, they've shown, if you notice... 2012, 13, 14, the past three year has been the first time in that decade run that they've had consecutive seasons back to back to back of the ERA dropping from season to season. So that's a, an interesting trend that ties along with Mickey Callaway and Terry Francona and this pitching staff that perhaps that back and forth pattern that we've seen for the last 10 years, maybe they've got a grip on it here. It's going to be a real, that's going to be such a big part of how far these Indians go is if that bullpen regresses, if Atchison and Shaw and all of these guys get old overnight, the Indians are in big trouble unless they're getting seven, eight innings a night from their starters. Other than that, then they're in trouble. But it appears that perhaps they may know the formula to continuing to maximize this bullpen, but that's going to be key. Right, and you know, he, he, I would love to see them do as well as they did last year with a 3-1 something ERA. That's really, really good. Even if they, you know, regress a little bit to 3.4 or 3.5, you know, that's pretty much okay. If you don't want everything falling apart, so we're up in the 4s and 4.5s, you know, that's really bad. In fact, it's actually worse than a starting pitcher having that kind of, of an ERA because, you know, the bullpen are pitching late in the game in usually tight situations. Otherwise, you might still have the starter out there. So, you know, it becomes more and more crucial for the uh, bullpen to perform well. And uh, a 4.5-something ERA for your bullpen is going to lead to some losses. Because when you're a starting pitcher, you could give up a couple of home runs early in the game and still stick in there and find your group and end up winning the game. So, yeah, so what you have to hope is that the bullpen can mostly keep it together, if not be, you know, really great, because you don't want that one aspect of the team to drag you, to drag you down like the defense did last year, because it's really frustrating when, you know, the starting pitch is going well, the hitting is coming through, and then the bullpen comes in and just blows it all up and loses the game. If you have this one that. aspect of your team that's sinking everybody, that can be very demoralizing. So it's one of those situations where as long as the bullpen can, you know, keep it together and not, you know, cause major your problems, then I think we're going to be in good shape, because when you overall look at this entire roster, one of the reasons why I think people are predicting the Indians to do so well is because they don't have any glaring weaknesses on paper. You don't look at them and say, well, this team is fine, but boy, they don't have a second baseman, or boy, their bullpen is really shoddy. Everything looks either great or pretty darn good. I mean, everything. That's why they look so good on paper, so it's good to see if they can really do it in real life, but... um, the bullpen, we have to hope that they show up as well on paper, uh, in real life as they do on paper, I should say. And guys, of course, not. I just want to stress, not only the very fickle nature of bullpens in general and how they usually go up and down from season to season, the exact opposite of what you expected, but the reason for so much concern here is the Indians used their bullpen. They set a record last year. Terry Francona became the manager who went to his bullpen more than any other manager in the history of American League baseball last year. Only time ever a team has had four 
pitchers out of the bullpen pitching 70 or more games in the American League. And, of course, Shaw set the franchise record with 80. But the Indians, being a team that constantly tells you how much they rely on those advanced analytics and those things that we talk about, they insist that they've monitored all of the categories, all of the numbers that go with that, and that they feel confident that there is not going to be a blowback. Of course, any team's going to tell you that their plan is solid until it falls apart. But because they rely so much on those analytics and they're they're using that to back up their belief, I at least at least there's a substance that they're presenting to why they're not just going, hey, listen to the man behind the curtain here, and this is why the bullpen is right. going to be. You know, they're at least saying we've done our research and we believe that the way they were used was in a way that they're not going to have a terrible bounce or bounce down i guess this coming season that's going to be that's going to be a big key man so we're talking about all this where are you at heading into the season with the tribe what do you see for the indians this year for a win total and for the the the, where this thing is going to wind up for indians here well i have to say that i'm more confident now in the Indians than I was at the beginning of spring training. I mean, I think part of it has to be, you know, hearing so many other people say, wow, this team could possibly make the playoffs. And even Sports Illustrated saying they're going to go to the World Series. That's, you know, kind of a big deal. So it's it's one of those things where, you know, you look at your own team in your own town and you say, hey, these guys are great. But when other people are starting to say it too, they're like, hey, it's not just me. It's not just us. It's not a case of in the inflation, as you might say. So <laughs> that, that's just the fact that other people are starting to recognize the Indians, too. I think that gives me a little more confidence. And again, the fact that nothing really bad has happened in the spring training, you know, like any major injuries, you know, we're coming in there with pretty much all of our main guys, except Swisher, whom we knew. And like we were talking about, you know, this team doesn't even need to rely on Swisher even to come back. I mean, this team is fine without him. So he's not, it's not like, well, we can only do well if he comes through. So, or, you know, if he comes back. So, that's good. So, a lot of this, everything looks good on paper. You know, you can't tell what's going to happen until it really happens. But even, you know, if a starting pitcher goes down, you know, we've got people in Columbus. We've got Tomlin who could come in. We've got Salazar who hopefully gets together and come in. So, there's even a lot of starting pitching depth in Columbus. Like, four deep in Columbus. So, that's, you know, I mean, this team pretty much is as prepared as it can possibly be. I'm pretty confident that they're going to at least make the playoffs. I I think that this team could get at least 88 wins. And one of the biggest reasons why I think this team is going to make the playoffs is simply because I'm very confident that the Royals won't, and the Tigers are going to come back at least a little bit. I mean, I know Verlander's already on the DL. I know it's just for a little while, but the fact that they've already lost Porcello and Scherzer, you know, the the Tigers are have, you know, they've Put some other guys in there, but they're definitely, I think, going to be weaker than before. So even if the Indians don't win the division, which they very well might, I really have a good feeling about the Indians making the playoffs. And I have to say that they're going to get at least 88 wins, maybe 90. I got to tell you, now, besides all the the baseball reasons that we've talked about and why I, I feel that the Indians win 90 games and win the division, but here's another thing, too is okay if and most people even those like Mike Brandenburg who don't see the big top end but they say okay I see the Indians at 85 86 wins or something let's let's use that as a baseline that is, that would equal three consecutive winning seasons and in general in baseball especially when you and I I don't have I don't have these records in front of me so there's obviously going to be exceptions that I'm not talking about but in general I don't remember a lot of sustained runs of three plus years like that that don't either go up or go down like okay year one was okay, and they, they got the wild card. In year two, you're building on year one. That's back-to-back winning seasons, building blocks, whatever you want to say. Uh, usually, when you start to get to three or four years of, of sustained success, you're either going to have a good run 
or it's going to fall out. The bottom's going to fall out. You know, you don't hear a lot of teams that just win 86 games three, four, five years in a row. You know what I'm saying? And it feels like yeah. the Indians are one of those teams that have built for a couple of years, and now is the season where those players and that experience and that group that's come together takes it to another level. And that, to me, it, it's still, we're talking about four, five, six wins in most people's predictions, which is why I think it's so funny. Some people can have the most optimistic outlook at World Series. Another person can say they don't make the playoffs at all, and they're five wins apart from each other. You know what I mean? Right. Like You're going five games. How is five, like, how is five games? that big of a difference but it's just the way you look at it I guess the outlook that you choose to take but I just think that very often you don't see teams meander through three relatively you know at least in this market you you know I think the core has grown together and I think you're going to see a group. It's so easy for us in Cleveland to look at woe is me, but this team, it's not just good. The bottom's not just going to drop out of this team. In my opinion, you've got a good solid baseball team that has been together for a couple of years in a row. And I, I think that that pays dividends this summer down there at progressive field, man. That's right, and I think that slowly but surely, you know, the fans are starting to recognize that. Remember, in their first year that they won back in 2013, the fans kind of couldn't believe it, and they really were sort of still reticent to, to, to believe. And I think that what you have to do is you have to get the fans to believe going into the season and just so they can just mentally and emotionally invest and say, you know, I'm going to follow the Indians this year, and I'm pretty sure they're going to make the playoffs because if you – if you, if you come into a season thinking that you're not going to like, reach the playoffs or that your team is going to be a tease and that they're going to let you down, then, you know, it's very likely for fans to kind of let their minds wander and let their attentions really wander and not buy tickets to the games. But I think that the Indians have that little bit of a track record right now. They look very good and they look very, you know, uh, possible to, to reach the playoffs again. And I think that if they can get off to a good start, uh, then I think that they can, you know, capture the imagination of the fans, and really in a perfect world, if the Cavs go on a great run and win the, possibly, let's talk maybe they can win the whole thing, and you know, if once all that, that huge high, once everybody comes down from that high, if, they, if people look up in June and see the Indians in first place, they're going to just want to keep that momentum going, and it might be a situation where you're not just, well, let's wait around for Browns camp to start, you might start to see people start to be really excited about the Indians, possibly even off a high from the Cavs. That's what I'm predict- predicting, projecting, however you want to put it, man. I really see a lot of synergy coming together down there. It's going to be a lot of fun. It starts on Monday, a week from today. It starts here in Cleveland, baby, with the home opener. I can't wait, Jeff. Next week, you and I, hey, man, we will have a chance to break down the very first real-life Cleveland Indians game this season when we talk on Tuesday. I can't wait. It's going to be wonderful. Finally, after all this uh, build-up, we can get to the games that really count, and we'll be able to talk about that first game. As long as it doesn't get rained out, we'll be in good shape. Absolutely. That's, that's. I guess that's the caveat there. Hopefully we're good on that one. Jeff, what do you got going on this weekend? Easter? Anything uh, going on with you guys? Well, we got Easter and uh, the Final Four, but actually I'm going to be on the mic tomorrow night at uh, Cage Madness 35 down in New Philadelphia, Ohio, if you're uh, free that night, if you're down in Tuscarawas County and want to see some fights, you come on out to West High Auto in a new, in a new Philadelphia. It's West High Auto. They're going to take out the cars from the showroom and they're going to bring in the cage for some MMA. Somebody needs to owe me some money for these plugs. No, I'm just kidding. You guys, get out there and check out Jeff. If you're looking for something to get into this weekend, go check it out, man. Check out the Cage Madness down there. What is the website? You got a website, man? Yeah, it's ExplosiveFightPromotions.com. Or just go on Facebook and look for Cage Madness. ExplosiveFightPromotions.com. When you hand them your ticket money, say, give this to the Sports Fix guy because that's where I heard about the show. All right, anyways, I'm just kidding. I'm (laughs) just kidding. Go have some fun. All right, Jeff, my man, you enjoy the weekend. Enjoy your holiday and your cage madness and the Easter Bunny. And then, baby, home opener on Monday. You and I circle back around the wagons on Tuesday and talk about it, my friend. Sounds great. Thanks very much. You have a happy Easter, too.
You got it. My man, Jeff Gorman, Indians101.com, Browns101.com as well, too. We'll jump back in on the uh, Browns talk with him next week. No reason today because there's really just not a whole lot of things going on to talk about. Although, hey, man, call my buddy Brian Windhorst there. He'll make something up, and then we can talk about that. Let's take a break. Final break of the hell. Final break of the week, man. Let's uh, come on back. We got a final four here, Monsters games to set up on tap and get you ready for the weekend. Don't go anywhere. Final segment of the Sports Fix, baby, coming up next. It starts with the very first inning. Indian fever. Each game is a brand new beginning. It's the hits, the homers, the double plays. It's how you feel when we win. So catch Indian fever. Be a believer with the Cleveland Indians. And now, a very special announcement from the Sports Fix. Black bears weigh between two and 500 pounds. Brown bears weigh between 300 and over 1,000 pounds. Black bears run away from you. Brown bears run at you. When attacked by a bear, simply lie still on the ground and cover your face and head with your hands. When the bear is finished batting you around and mauling you, contact the U.S. Forest Service. And that was a message from the Sports Fix. <laughs> Guys, want to take just a second as we head into this break and remind you about the official business printing source of the Sports Fix, our friends at Signs and Ship. Signs and Ship, I'm telling you, Chris and Pam, they've taken care of me since day one, and they can do the same for you. Whether you're a small business that's already been established and you're looking to grow to that next level and expand your business, or perhaps you've got an idea that you just know is going to be a great business and you need to figure out how to brand it and how to promote it and put it out there, Signs and Ship is the place for you. If you need a logo, they can create one for you. They have a fantastic graphic designer. Business cards, signs, banners, yard signs, mobile advertising, anything you can think of that you need to promote your business, they've got it at Signs and Ship. The best thing about them, too, is each of their locations, whether it's the home base here in Elyria, Ohio that I work with, or their spots in Virginia, Florida, and Pennsylvania. It's all local sourced. Very important to me because we all understand that small business is the lifeblood of the community. So check them out, signsandship.com, or call Chris and Pam today, 440-323-6060, the home office in Elyria, Ohio. Signs and Ship, quality printing at affordable prices. It's the Sports Fix. We'll be right back. Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and, and starts start getting, getting real. real. Real time spent making real decisions, creating real victory. I'm the greatest man in the world! And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Yeah. Nobody, Nobody does, does that, that like, like Fantasy, Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. The trophy's 12 feet high, and it is glorious! Football, baseball, hoops, you name it, they have it. Plus, they have awesome draft kits and party supplies to make all your preseason activities the envy of everyone. If your league needs a ring, belt, or trophy, or you want to upgrade what you already have, there's literally only one place to go. If you're going to be a fantasy jock, do it right. It's mine. The most magnificent belt ever created. And it's mine. With America's fantasy sports superstore, fantasyjocks.com. No football? No problem at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead. From their awesome wing Mondays to every single Cavaliers and Buckeye Hoops games in full HD. Tyree supposed to D, goes inside, two drops it home right down Euclid. That's way up in there for two. The excitement never stops. Every day of the week brings a different set of food and amazing drink specials. And now Fans, Harry Buffalo North Olmsted is the home for every UFC pay-per-view live on the big screens. Let's get it all! And let's not forget their mouth-watering trademark, the Bison Burger. They sure are good. Nobody does bison like Harry Buffalo. The perfect combination of healthy and delicious. Hey there, eat up, y'all. You this good church-going folk. Y'all deserve a little treat. What are you waiting for? Get to Harry Buffalo, just outside Great Northern Mall today. Harry Buffalo, Harry Buffalo. join the herd. Join the herd. Hi, this is Dean Chenoweth, head coach of Cleveland's Lake Erie Monsters, and you're listening to The Sports Fix. Welcome. 
Welcome back to the Sports Fix. Wrapping things up here. Final segment of the day. J-Rock back with you here. Thanks to everybody who's been a part of the show. All of you guys hitting us up throughout the social media and the phones earlier and all of that. Thank you guys. All weekend long. Keep it going. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Tweet with us at the Sports Fix CLE. Email us, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. You can call the hotline 24 7 216 539 7535. Thanks to Eddie Jansen for joining us from the Lake County Sentinel. Thanks to Jeff Gorman from Indians101.com for being here as well. You guys, all of you, will be back here on Monday doing the thing, kicking off another week, baby, kicking off the month and the week hard. As we hit opening day, Dan Wismar will be here from the Cleveland fans. Should be a lot of fun. And, you know, during the break here, I was getting things ready for the uh, for the final segment here and, and just looking around to see if, you know, there's any breaking news during the show, anything that I may need to, to touch upon here. Man, I don't know. I'm a little, And I haven't read the whole thing, so I guess i got to look into this. We'll talk some more maybe next week. But I saw this, uh, that uh, the arbitrators ruled that Josh Hamilton, of course, uh, Josh Hamilton, uh, violated the baseball po- of course he's in the drug treatment program and uh, his his uh, issues are well known throughout the years uh, he was the MVP back in 2010 um, he's had previous issues he's in the, the drug treatment program he admitted self reported that he relapsed with cocaine and alcohol and apparently uh, now an arbitrator has ruled that that admission is not uh, punishable somehow by MLB. MLB disagrees. They're going to look to uh, pursue this even more. They were prepared to discipline Hamilton. I, I don't get it. I mean, okay, if he had peed dirty in a cup, then he could be punished. But if he comes to you and says, I'm going to pee dirty in a cup, so let me tell you what happened, you can't punish him for that? That does not make a whole lot of sense at all. Um and if that's the case, then all you did was just taught me. And if I'm Major League Baseball, then you just taught me that the minute somebody comes clean, I hand them a cup and I go, now you go pee in that cup right now so that I can suspend you for it. Because obviously I can't suspend you when you come to me and admit that you just snorted cocaine or, or whatever. I can't do anything about that. That does not make a lot of sense to me. And again, I don't want to go crazy because I, I, I'll look into this and see maybe I'm missing something. But it appears to me that this is one of those legal protections that in actuality is the opposite of what everybody involved should want because you should want the guy to be able to continue to get help and, and deal with what he's dealing with. But that that's odd there. And that also, to me, uh, I don't know. If I'm base again, if I'm baseball, I wouldn't want to take somebody's uh, confession. I guess the next because now all of a sudden that's all you got to do. Now, let me tell you something before you find out about it, and then you can't be punished for it. That doesn't. Hey, I got to tell you, I've been using steroids. Before you test me, let me just go ahead and tell you, I've been sticking a needle in my ass. So now you can't punish me for it. And uh, you know, I don't get that. I, I don't know, but. Uh, We'll see. I'll talk some more about that next week. Again, I want to look more into it, but scratching my head off the just the cusp there about the topic. Another thing I'm scratching my head about is who thinks it's like a big deal uh, the, about Sarah Thomas becoming the first full-time female official in the NFL. I know I guess that's a big deal because it's, it, it is breaking, uh, breaking down barriers or whatnot, but... It's 2015. That is about as big of that's less of a deal than the not a big deal about the gay guy trying to play in the sports because everybody already knows they've been there. There's no shortage of gay athletes. They've just been in the closet, but they're there. Guys know about it. People don't talk. It's not like this is new. And this is 2015. It's not groundbreaking. Even if you're this, that, and the other thing, whatever your opinions are, I'm not even getting into that part of the conversation. It's a blase conversation in 2015. It's just like, yawn you're gay show me some like like that's not the shocker that it was in 1995 like in 1995 that was you know oprah's giving away you know stuff off of her couch and we're celebrating people coming out of the closet in 2015 it's like yawn show me something else because that's not that's not it's just that doesn't that's the world we live in it's uh, that's the world and again becoming the first female referee okay i mean there's not a job in this world that females don't do at this point. So that's really not a story. That's all I'm saying. That's that's not really a story to me. Who cares? I see, Bruce, I completely disagree. Bruce in the chat room. Uh, uh, in a league that's already softened the game, now they have women. Really? Really? Because I know some pretty badass women out there. My girl Jessica I is hardly a soft woman. 
You know what I mean? There's some badass women out there, man. And uh, I highly doubt that having a girl blowing a whistle on a football field is is going to just, just – completely soften the game of football. Get out of here, man. I hear you and I appreciate your opinion, but that's nothing. That, that That's nothing like to me at this point. I, some of the nastiest, sharkiest CEOs in the world are women. They will cut your, they will cut your testicles off and mail them to you, partner, and tell you that they did it. So I don't, I disagree with that thought in, uh, in 2015. So again, the fact that this is like popping up everywhere, big breaking report, the first female official. I mean, from the fact that it's the first one, I guess that's about the only noteworthy thing, but any argument about should have feet, what, Seriously. And I'm not trying to get into that. I, I agree. We're not talking about playing football here. We're not talking about being physically equipped to play the game. We're talking about being a referee here and an official. And no offense to them. They work very hard, too. I'm not saying that to in, belittle or any in, in, in lessen, lessen the uh, what the ramifications are of being an official. But that's nothing to me. That's... Uh, just a nothing story, but it is what it is. That's the only reason I bring that up there. But uh, I'm just I'm looking through the things that make the news. But then again, if it can't make the news, then they make the news anyway, and they literally make the news. So there you go. Now, now, it, now they're okay, Bruce. You want to argue about the female officials in other sports and and whether they're whether they're good or not at what they do? But I don't think the fact that they're a woman has anything to do with whether or not they're good. There's a million, yeah, most of them, because they're all male pretty much uh male referees in every sport that are god awful and i wouldn't hire them if they offered to pay me to work the game but you know what's the difference they're bad at their job too there i don't think the female aspect of it just has a single thing to do with it and trust me i can be all macho i can be hey man i'm a pro wrestler i live in locker rooms since i was 18 years old i can be as macho manly ron burgundy as you want man but uh that just that's just uh, that's nothing you know like i just just don't see anything to that whatsoever more power to her man go out there and uh and do your thing if you can do your job do it and if not you won't have it at least that's the way i look at it until people make a big deal and freak show out of it and then it becomes something that it shouldn't be so anyways that's just my uh my little deal i just don't again i don't see the earth shattering oh this is a uh, you know, this is the thing. Yeah, it's just uh, I'm I don't I'm not with it. But uh, anyways, let's see what else is going on this weekend. Is there anything else going? on? Oh, that basketball thing, <laughs> that basketball thing that's uh, going on over the weekend. They call it the Final Four. Michigan State Duke is the first of the two big big matchups here. That's going to be a great one there. Bryn Forbes, by the way, former CSU Viking, continuing to do well there, uh, help and contribute to that Spartans run. We saw him transfer from last season. Uh, can Duke do it? I hope so, because it's the only way I get any more points left in my bracket. Wisconsin and UK, of course, the big, big focus on the other side. Wisconsin's the next one that gets a chance to end the run of perfection for the University of Kentucky. They sit at 38-0. and They need to make it to 40 to finish their uh, quest here. Can they knock off Wisconsin? Oh, man, I got to tell you, as much as I, I've been picking against against them all the way, uh, I think they got this one. I think they make it to uh to the final to the final game here at least. But Wisconsin's got some some stuff. They can make this a game. That's gonna be a good one. That's the marquee game at nine o'clock on Saturday night. And the thirty five and three Wisconsin against thirty eight and 0 Kentucky. And then the two winners are gonna do it on Monday when Dan Bismar's here. We'll be able to preview that one. Me I see, I see Kentucky Duke being the uh, matchup there, but you know, don't, don't. Something inside me says, don't count out Tom Izzo. Don't, do not count out Tom Izzo to knock off Duke and have his seventh seeded Spartans right there representing the Big Ten in the uh, in the national title. And if that's the case, man, uh, that that would be an interesting dynamic if it was them and. Uh, if it was them in Kentucky, of course. But that's uh, speculating. Let's see what happens. going to be a great Final Four. Four traditionally strong teams and franchises there. Going to be an excellent uh, Final Four here. And it looks to be a, a good championship game on tap. As I said, Dan will be here Monday for us to look ahead and preview exactly what that game's going to be. Of course, the Indians have their final two 
uh, non-counting games for the next 100 and what 68 days or something like that they've got two spring training games left uh, yesterday we talked about it earlier Zach McAllister went out there and pitched into the seventh inning McAllister looked really strong yesterday tribe and the Brewers today Carlos Carrasco with his final start for the Indians that one is going out across the Indians radio network guys so you'll be able to hear that everywhere with Hammy and Rosie doing the call Carlos Carrasco on the mound today they wrap it up this weekend and we start it for real come Monday, man, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Speaking of winding down to the end, Monsters will get Doug Plagans in early next week to rejoin us, but the Lake Erie Monsters making that playoff push. They grabbed some points, missed an opportunity to sweep the points away from Milwaukee this week. That one, that could loom in a little bit here because they had the shot to grab four points there. Still grabbed three. Monsters now sit Four points back from the final playoff spot. It's right there. It's for the taking. We will look ahead. Of course, you got the Toronto Marlies next up for the Lake Erie Monsters here. That one's coming up tonight, 7.30. And if you're here, you head down to the queue. It's the third of three here at home after those back-to-back with Milwaukee. Then it's right back on the road early next week, Tuesday. Chicago will get dug in before that. But here's a big one here. Toronto, another chance for the Monsters to continue this playoff push and get some points they need it. Like I said, we're down in the final handful of games left in this season. Monsters, they let some opportunities slip away earlier, but now they've got a chance here. They control their own destiny. They're playing all the teams that they need to play along the way. Toronto, another team directly in front. Actually, as we sit today, Monsters in Toronto tied at 73 points. They have a chance to break that there and move ahead, get themselves up into 10th spot in the conference. Of course, the top eight teams head to the playoffs. We'll talk to Doug about that next week. Get down to the queue. Check them out tonight. Monsters action. Get down there on Sunday and watch the Cavaliers, baby, as the Bulls down at the queue for a potential playoff preview as well. Going to be a lot of fun. You guys cannot wait to talk about all of this on Monday. Preview a national title game. Look ahead to the, oh, can you hear the excitement, baby? I'm ready to go. Opening day. Next time we talk, we're talking about that and so much more. Same bad time, same bad channel, live Monday at noon here across the Sports Fix Radio Network. Hey, guys, if you like what we do, if you like what you're listening to, share this show throughout the weekend. Get your fellow Indians fans on board. We talk tribe day and night, baby, unlike the rest. Get them on board so we can kick this thing off on Monday. Share what you're listening to. Bring some friends to the party. And you come back with us as well. Join the party back here live at noon on Monday. We love you, Cleveland. Have some great times this weekend. Enjoy all the games that are going on. And we'll see you Monday, Daddy, live right here on the Sports Fix.